Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash BeScared60 and use code BeScared60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash BeScared60 and use code BeScared60 for 60% off plus free shipping. This story takes place in a a very small town in the northeast region of the United States in the summer before I went off to college in 2015. After I graduated high school, my parents decided to move to a smaller, more affordable house about 45 minutes north into the mountains. We stayed in my childhood home because the public schools in my area were the best in the state and my parents really valued my education. I ended up going off to an amazing university And now I have an incredible career because of my excellent education. As most people in the US know, amazing public education usually means higher property taxes. My parents got to the point where they could not afford the taxes on their 4,000 square foot home anymore and they decided to sell it just after I graduated from high school. Their home is humble and it sits on a beautiful piece of land on the side of a beautiful mountain. The trees are always really green and there's a lot of wildlife around too. They don't have many neighbors either as their driveway is about a mile and a half long. But this is what they chose to live in after I went off to college. In August of 2015, we moved into a new house. I wasn't planning on staying long as I was getting ready to head off to college as a freshman for the first time. We decided to have a little bit of a housewarming party with a bunch of family friends and my best friend at the time came as well. My dad was manning the barbecue, my mum was making drinks, we were playing with our dogs. It was a really nice time and everybody had a lot of fun. My dad had built a brick fire pit in our backyard as well. Just to set the scene here for you, the fire pit was about 30 feet from our back patio door and we had a picnic table and other seats all around. Behind the seating was the tree line And sometimes at night, it was incredibly dark. You needed a flashlight to see even 10 feet in front of you. With the fire pit lit, you couldn't really see somebody else unless they were either sitting next to you or across from you in front of the pit. And what I'm getting at is that it was really hard to see. Anyway, my best friend decided to stay the night and we asked my dad if we could make some s'mores. As it was getting a little chilly, as it does in the late summer in the northeast at night, my parents left us outside with my dog Nino. Nino was a huge 100 pound black lab pit bull mix. He was such a loyal and incredible dog that my dad trained as his right hand man pretty much. He was our protector, as he could run extremely fast, was very strong, and alerted us when something went bump in the night. Side note, he passed away a week before I got married in 2022. He was 17 years old and lived an adventurous life with my parents, hunting squirrels, laying out in the sun and running amok, so he had a good life. Nino, though, laid in between us facing the tree line, and my best friend was at my right. Our backs were to the dark, dense tree line, which was our first mistake. We were laughing, joking, and eating s'mores together, planning for the future and generally excited about going off to college together. She decided to play some music and we just relaxed, feeling content and at ease. It was a really, almost perfect summer night, until Nino started growling. I saw his ears perk up and his head sort of cocked to the side. He then sat up and continued to growl. My best friend and I both looked at each other, thinking Nino just heard a stray animal or something non-threatening. This area was known for lots of deer and rarely a coyote or a wolf as well. As he was trained to help my dad hunt deer, we assumed it was a buck or a fawn in the distance behind us. So we went back to singing along to the music playing and just talking about our fall 2015 class schedule. But again, Nino started growling which was our second mistake. We didn't call out for my dad. We didn't even think that there was a problem until Nino started barking repeatedly, this time louder and more vicious. He stood up and started barking as if alerting us to activity beyond the tree line that we couldn't see. At this, we stood up as well, 
the fire obscuring our view. My best friend took her phone, paused the music, and turned on her flashlight. She started to walk towards the edge of the tree line with Nino by her side, still growling and barking, alerting us to not go any further and to call for help. We stood still in silence, listening. Uh, I was too afraid to even breathe at this point, I think. She started walking into the woods, though, and when she shined her flashlight, she saw a figure. Someone was there, peering behind a tree. A man with a green suit and green pants on, about 5'11", with glasses, too. We screamed and ran as fast as we could inside, leaving the fire unattended and this creepy man behind the tree. What we didn't know at the time is where this man actually came from. In any case, we crashed through our front door, breathless with Nino trailing behind us, and startled my mother, who was washing dishes at the time and cleaning up from the party. She was talking to my dad about something they saw on the news, and I think we cut him off mid-sentence to explain that there was a man dressed in all green lurking behind a tree in the woods. Obviously, we didn't know how long he'd been there or if he was still there, but we were both crying. I remember feeling extremely sick, like I was about to throw up, and my dad jumped up, grabbed his shotgun and headlamp, and ran outside with Nino. My mum gathered us into the living room, shut all the lights off in the house, and locked the doors. She told us to be quiet and that she was going to call 911. As she did that, my best friend and I shook in fear. We were anticipating gunshots and screaming at some point, but thankfully, we never heard any. My mum, now on the phone with 911, described what we saw to the operator, and I heard my mum say, oh, in a really alarming way. At this point, my dad came back inside, and my mum let him know that the police were on their way to us. Being in a small town on the mountain with less than 10,000 people, that means that we don't get our own police force. We get the state police every time that there's a call made to emergency responders. My dad, though, he put his gun away and waited outside for the police to show up. And to our bewilderment, they didn't just send a police officer, but ten, and an entire SWAT team and helicopter to circle the area. We were obviously and rightfully terrified. I was practically having a panic attack at this point. The police officers came inside of our home and asked my best friend and me what the man was wearing, what he looked like, etc., if we were able to discern any scars or tattoos. We explained that we had matching green outfit and the glasses. The officer excused himself and alerted the police and the SWAT members outside of our description. They started to search the woods behind our home with guns drawn at this point, flashlights and the helicopter circling above too. They advised us to stay inside and that they would let us know when or if they found something. After about 25 minutes, we got another knock on our door. It was not one, but two officers this time. My dad let them in and they began to explain the situation. One officer explained that we must have seen on the news that a convicted felon from prison about 20 miles away escaped into the mountains. The police had apparently set up a perimeter of 10 miles around the prison, but the convict escaped them yet again somehow. The outfit that the man was wearing, as well as our description, signaled to them that the escaped convict was 100% lurking through our remote, densely wooded backyard that night. The all-green outfit was a standard issue for prisoners in my state at that time. They did not, however, find the man near us after 25 minutes of searching, which means that he was still out there somewhere. The officers let us know that they were going to have a squad car stay and watch our house for a few days as they were unable to locate the fugitive and believed that he's still an active threat to our safety. That night and for three nights after that, we all slept in the living room together. My dad's shotgun was within arm's reach of him at all times too. Later that week, we got another knock on our door from officers stationed outside of our home. They let us know that the man was back in police custody finally and that we were now safe. They advised us to get security cameras and how sorry they were that this happened to us. After that, my parents spent about $10,000 on security cameras and fencing for our backyard. It's now all fenced in and we have about four cameras to watch the tree line at all times too. And I guess because you just never really know what will actually happen or what goes bump in the night, it's probably worth it.
This event happened to me and a friend from out of town that I had invited to go hunting one afternoon. This location was in South Louisiana, in an area thick with woods and a lot of palmetto, up to six foot in height, in some places, and the water that we had to walk into to get to my deer stands were at least up to our waist at times, so it was slow moving in the mile that we had to walk to our deer stands, and my friend wasn't used to this tough terrain, but he kept up, and when I got to the first stand, which was about 15 feet off of the ground, with a ladder to climb up. Once he was up, I told him that I would be by to pick him up in about half an hour, after dark, since I was about a half mile past him. It was a full moon that was reflecting off of the water, allowing us to hunt a few minutes longer, and when it became too dark to see, I climbed down from my deer stand with my rifle on my shoulder, and I started walking slowly towards my friend to pick him up. And when I was almost to his stand, I shine my light up, and... He just wasn't in the stand. So I shine my light on the ground at the bottom of the stand and there he was, leaning back against the tree that the stand was on. And what was odd was that he wouldn't look my way, even after me calling his name. So I walked up to him within a couple of feet and asked if he was ready to go. And that's when he finally turned his head and looked towards me. And what I saw in his face scared me so bad that I took my rifle off of my shoulder, putting it between me and him. His eyes were rolled back in his head, and his mouth was wide open, just standing there looking at me, not saying a word, and he wasn't answering me either. I was asking him what the heck he was doing and what was wrong, but he wouldn't answer me. So there I was, a mile or so back in the woods with solid palmettos all around us, and up to my waist in water, with my good friend looking at me as if he was possessed or something. And yes, at this point, I was scared. So, eventually I finally slapped him in the face, and he seemed to snap back to himself. I then asked if he was okay, and his only words to me were, let's get out of here now. So, with me not knowing what the heck was going on, I made him walk in front of me the whole way back to the truck, and we get on in and we left without saying a word. Eventually I asked him what happened in the woods, why did he look so shocked or possessed like that? He started crying and then he started telling me about how apparently he was sitting there in the stand when he heard something coming through the water, moving palmettos as if it was walking, and when it got close enough to see what it was... He said that it was a man that apparently looked like he had been skinned alive, like he had no skin at all on him, and he said that he was so scared that after this thing had passed him, he climbed down and hid under the stand against the tree so that it wouldn't see him if it came back. He was in shock, and when I got to him, that's why he had looked like he did apparently. He was so shook up and crying that Eventually, I had to tell him to pull over so that I could drive. Well, a week went by and I was talking to my little cousin who had gone out on tour at a near Indian memorial. And they were explaining how this Indian tribe would skin men of their tribe alive and turn them loose in the woods when they had committed a serious crime in the tribe. And my friend who had witnessed this skin man a week earlier wasn't from around this area and had no way of knowing this, so... What did he see that put him in shock like that? Was it a ghost of one of these Indians who was skinned alive years ago? I don't know, but I just know that the shape my friend was in when I got to him that night in the woods is something that I will never forget. With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Looking for an easy way to eat well, save money, and enjoy a delicious meal while listening to scary stories? Cut back on expensive takeout and delivery and get started with HelloFresh. You'll love how fast, easy, and affordable it is to whip up a restaurant-quality meal right in your own kitchen. You can customize select meals by swapping proteins or sides, or even adding protein to a veggie dish. And now, you can even upgrade for organic chicken or organic ground beef. 
Personally, I'm a sucker for a good burrito, and their Southwest pork and bean burrito is seriously delicious. I also have found their ingredients to be really well packaged and the instructions easy to follow. That is a win-win in my books. Quick fresh meals that taste amazing and I don't need to take that extra trip to the grocery store, saving me a ton of time with my busy schedule, has honestly been a lifesaver for me. Also, just to keep you guys up to speed, Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh, and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from, there's something for everyone. I really like switching between the brands, and now all of you guys can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. So, go to hellofresh.com slash bscared60 and use code bscared60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash bscared60 and use code bscared60 for 60% off plus free shipping. America's number one meal kit. I'm 19 years old and living far from home in a studio room. I'm often up late and last week I was just doing some laundry at around 11pm-ish when I saw a man sitting in the lobby. I saw him around a, a bit at night but I didn't think much of it. Anyway, I'm in the laundry room. I just put my clothes in the dryer, I think, and I hear the laundry room door beeping, which meant that someone was coming in. There was the man, standing there, with no clothes to wash, just sort of staring at me. I maneuvered around him and headed to the lifts. He followed me quickly and cornered me and asked for my Snapchat. I was tired and I just wanted to get back to my room so I stupidly gave it to him. I figured that he'd message and try and flirt a bit and I'd say I have a boyfriend. Sorry if you thought that this was anything else and that would be the end of it. I'm about 5'4 with very long red hair and I'm half Indian and English with Afghanistani descent so I'm white passing I guess but kind of exotic. But people tend to stare at me a bit because I look a bit different. Anyway, he starts messaging me. It's kind of normal, but then he starts saying weird stuff like, I saw you a month ago and I was impressed. I've been visiting a friend and staying here, and I've been watching you. I noticed that you come out mostly at night. He told me that he was Saudi Arabian and only visiting for five more days. But then it gets worse. He then says, I love you. I can't help it. Then I say I have a boyfriend, and he says I only want you, and continues to completely ignore that. He asks to come to my room, and I said no. Then apparently he wanted a hug. He asked me if I lived alone and if I was a virgin. He kept saying that he loved me and that I was perfect for him, that I impressed him. At that point, I recorded all the messages on Snapchat, spoke to him a little bit more to gather evidence so that I could take it to the reception in the morning, because apparently he's been watching me for a month. I got my guy friend who lives on the second floor to walk me down to the laundry room too. We sat in the student lounge area and my friend calmed me down. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear at this point, but... We saw him around the laundry room again looking for me, but luckily I had already picked it up. I ran back to my room and my friend says that I can stay in his room, but I said that it's okay, I'll just lock my door. Then it's about 1am and I hear someone outside of my room trying to get in by sort of fiddling with the doorknob. I asked my friend if he was outside of my room and he messaged back, no. And at that, I just froze. I didn't want to make a sound, but I felt sick in my stomach and completely helpless. Thankfully, eventually it stopped and whoever it was, they must have left. In the morning, I reported this to the reception and then I went to stay a few days with my boyfriend. Then after that, I went to London to visit a friend and last night was the first time that I'd spent a night in my room since this happened. But I'm very paranoid now. Sadly, I, I should probably be used to this, but yeah, it is what it is. It's not the first time that I've been harassed like this. In fact, one guy tried to kiss me in a club by grabbing my head, and a bunch of other things have happened that I won't get into here. But anyway, I'm pretty afraid to go outside of my room after dark. 
I'm constantly looking over my shoulder and feeling paranoid. I just keep blaming myself for being too nice and I know it's my long thick hair that attracts people's eyes to me. I just want to cut it all off at this point. But has anybody else had a similar experience and how did you deal with it? Reception still hasn't updated me on if he's still in the building so I think I'll go and talk to them in the morning and see how everything is going. This is an experience that uh, I had a few years ago, which honestly made me a believer in the paranormal, and I hope you find it as interesting and as creepy as I did. So, I went out very early morning around 5am to take photos in the forest, since I've always liked the vibe of the forest, especially during the morning, since it has a kind of calmness to it. I live in central Sweden, where we have many deep forests everywhere, where much of it is untouched. Think plenty of moss and old trees. This particular forest that I went to was quite near my home. However, since I lived in the countryside, I was very alone with nobody else around, for miles in fact. During this morning, there was also fog lingering in the treetops from the surrounding rivers, which looked very cool to be honest. So, I was really ready to take some really nice photos. I went into the forest after parking my car along the road that went beside it, and started walking straight in. After maybe a, a hundred meters, I stopped to take some photos, mostly of dead trees and mushrooms and things like that. I was 20 and felt very artsy at the time, so yeah, <laughs> I was just like that. But after a few minutes, I started to hear knocking on trees. I thought it was probably a bird, since we have woodpeckers around here, so hearing that wasn't unusual, I guess. But the strange thing was that I started looking for it since it came from a tree that was right beside me, but I just couldn't find it anywhere. Unlucky, I thought. I wanted to see if I could get a nice photo after all, but I decided to move on in the end. I continued walking into the forest when I noticed something. The knocking or the pecking seemed to follow me as I walked. It continuously knocked on trees close to me. At this point... I didn't think too much about it, but that would change after a little while. I stopped at a point that looked really nice to set up my camera on a tripod in, and attempt to maybe snap some cool photos of the surrounding area and treetops. I sat down and continued to hear the knocking on a tree just a few meters behind me, and at this point, I started to feel a little bit weird since I hadn't really noticed how it seemed to follow me like that. A few seconds later, while changing my camera settings, I suddenly heard several very loud, clear, and heavy footsteps behind me that rapidly came closer and closer until it was right behind me, and my whole body instantly froze up. I have not till this day experienced chills like that through my entire body. After what felt like maybe several seconds, I flew up and turned to what I thought was some kind of a big animal, but... When I did, there was nothing there. For context too, besides a few trees, this area was not really that dense. Just a few trees here and there, but mostly moss and grass really. Which means that I, I should have seen it. In any case, I picked up all of my things and I started walking really quickly back towards my car. And that's when the knocking started again. It followed me again all the way and I just knew that something was mocking me. So I said out loud, yes, I'm leaving. I thought to myself that whatever it was, it didn't want me there. I continued to hear the knocking until I came back to the spot where I first started hearing it. And then it just stopped. I didn't though. I went straight back to my car and I immediately went home. Now, before this, I was skeptical about the paranormal, but it really changed my views. Since then, I've only ever had one more experience, but this one definitely really scared me. So about two years ago, I, a 16-year-old female, at the time 14 though, was home with my mum. 
It was just the two of us. My mom at the time was addicted to drugs and alcohol and was in an essentially drug-induced coma, so nothing would wake her up. I decided to take a bath while she slept. My bathroom door was locked, as was my mother's bedroom door, as she seemed to think that we didn't know about her addictions and kept it all locked so that we didn't find out. And so the house was completely silent. I had only been in the bath for maybe about half an hour before I heard my front door open. I assumed it was my older sister coming home back from work, as nobody else would just walk in like that. But I wanted to be sure, so I texted her. But immediately, I got very worried when she texted me back saying that, no, she wasn't home, why? Was somebody there? I froze. I could definitely hear footsteps now too. Our house was small, one story, and from the front door to the bathroom door was only like a small living room. And I heard a scraping noise coming up the hallway to the bathroom. I heard the scraping stop outside of the bathroom door, and then someone grabbed the doorknob and kept turning it very slowly side to side for about a minute. The entire time I sat there silent, frozen still and shaking like a leaf. I wanted to call my mum and ask if it was her, but... I didn't want whoever it was to hear the sound and get to my mum. After a while, I didn't hear anything. I stayed in the bathroom for what I think was about an hour, until I heard the front door open and click shut softly. I still stayed in the bathroom in the bath long after the water had gone cold, until I heard my sister come in and yell if I was here and if I was okay, and asked why the door was unlocked. I got out of the bath and heard her gasp before I had come out, but when I did, my blood instantly went cold. There was a line spanning the wall of the hallway where the paint had been cut off, like someone had trailed something sharp along the wall. Currently, the theory is that the scraping noise that I heard was someone trailing a knife on that wall just outside of that bathroom. So I was on the way home from Arby's with a mint chocolate shake, zoned out for a sec and almost actually didn't notice his car. I tried just letting him through but he insisted that I go on ahead. Again I didn't think much of it and just continued on walking. He drove on ahead and parked his car near some apartments. He had on a black polo shirt so I assumed that he was just dropping something off for a job or something. As I kept walking he approached me and offered me a $20 bill. I asked why, but couldn't understand what he said in his response. I refused since I know what's best for me. However, that didn't deter him. He grabbed my waist and I stepped to the side. He then started pulling me towards his car. I bit his hand so that he couldn't silence me and made sure to scream as loud as possible to try and attract any bystanders if I could. Unfortunately, he managed to get me into his car and just before he could close it, I stuck my foot through the door to keep it open. I then got out and made myself go limp since it added dead weight. Without warning, it creates sudden resistance and makes it harder for them to grasp you. Due to this quick thinking too, I was able to get away unharmed. I quickly booked it and I got on the phone with my mum once I was at a, a safe distance. I made sure to stay on the phone until I got back as well, but after that... I'd taken some time to calm down and waited for the cops to get there to get my statement. The officer ended up praising my quick thinking, telling me that I'd luckily done everything right in this situation. But please guys, do take self-defense seriously. I've only ever had a week-long course and just that alone had managed to save my life that day, I think. I didn't remember too much from my self-defense course and only used the basic techniques that I remembered which was making noise, dropping my weight, and checking behind me. Any other actions I'd taken were a result of logic and quick thinking. Chances are, though, that if I'd gotten more self-defense training, it likely wouldn't have been as close of a call as it was. Also, never accept money from strangers. While there are good Samaritans out there, there's also a lot of people who don't have your best interests in mind. If you do think that they have good intentions, make sure to double check by asking what they're offering you money for. If you don't get a good legitimate reason like I did, then make sure you refuse. 
If you refuse and they still persist, then take my advice and get out of there immediately. In 2017, I was an undergrad living with three other students in a rough student house in a big city. For context on the layout of the house, this will be beneficial for the story too. My bedroom was the only one on the ground floor beside the front door and opposite the kitchen. We only had a front door and front windows, no back door. My bed was in the middle of the room. The bottom of the bed was facing the bedroom door. There were three floors in total, two bedrooms on the second floor and another bedroom and sitting room on the third floor. And one June evening, we all decided to head out, with a few other friends who came around for pre-drinks, for a big drunken night out in the town to simultaneously celebrate end of exams, my 21st birthday, and one last big hurrah before everyone went back home or went travelling for the summer. Now, I'm not a huge clubber by any means, so me and my then boyfriend were ready to go home at around 1 or 1.30 in the morning. We hitched an Uber back, drunkenly got a takeaway, and passed out in bed at around 2, 2.30. At 4.30, we were both jolted awake, though, by one of my housemates slamming open the door with, We've been robbed. We rubbed our eyes in bewilderment as neither of us had woken up and thought that she was playing some sort of horrible prank. I mean, surely, given our proximity to the front door, we would have heard something. But we walked up the stairs to discover the upstairs rooms were largely ransacked and items were missing. Everyone's electricals that weren't on them were gone. Like laptops, iPads, cameras, passports were gone too, and my housemate's weed stash was taken as well. A baseball cap from the girl whose room was on the third floor was found in another person's bedroom on the second floor, meaning that the intruder wore the cap and took it off as he or they proceeded through the house. It then hit me though, what about my room? I raced downstairs to check my belongings and discovered that my handbag at the bottom of the bed was missing, and my ex's phone and wallet that were also at the bottom of the bed were also taken. My laptop was on the bedside table beside me and was untouched. But that means that... The intruder or intruders managed to break open the front door, go through the entire house, ransack rooms looking for things to steal, and actually open the door of the bedroom that we were sleeping in to take things right in front of the bed that we were in. And we never woke up to any of it. To say that I was shook when I found out what had happened was an absolute understatement. The police came to take our statements eventually and file a report, but nothing ever came of it. To this day, I'm still super uneasy to go to bed in an empty house after that night. I'm forever thankful that we never actually woke up in the middle of the robbery, or that I went home alone that night, because the outcome could have been very different. I've been asked many times now in responses and conversations all over the place to share my experiences as an order of St. John Chaplain and Demonologist. It's hard to know where to start to be honest, but the most important thing that I think is to say that these are my beliefs and experiences. I certainly don't begrudge you yours and definitely don't want to assert any kind of authority over the beliefs of others. As chaplains, we are not positioned within a church because we minister to communities. It really isn't our place to judge any member of that community, but only to care for and support them in their needs. Also, rule number one of the job is to disprove, disprove, and disprove again. Other than that, to save you the trouble, I'll share things in order of how much interest that I think that they get. I'll begin with experiences, then some insight into our processes, what I'm allowed to speak to anyway, how I got into the field, and then the training that I undertook. So, my experiences are this. General and passive paranormal experiences are part and parcel of the job. I'll touch on it more later, but I'm not afraid of things that go bump in the night. I used to be, but... Once you've studied and understand it, the paranormal loses its excitement and becomes more of a puzzle that needs to be solved. My passive experiences are things like every month or so I'll have some new knocking on our doors and windows, 
even though we live in a secure third floor apartment. I get random prods and pokes when I'm by myself, whispering, murmuring, growling, scratching, electrical interference, random mists, distorted shadows and shadow figures here and there. This has all become weekly occurrence, although when I say that it's usually just one of these things that happens, I deal with it and it goes away almost immediately. But this is probably my most fascinating one because it's a reoccurring event that happens every couple of months and I haven't yet solved the puzzle. You see, I travel a lot for my role and at the moment I've been sent to one of our small towns to train people, run mental health programs, or help with large-scale crisis responses. This results in my driving for long hours, sometimes during the day and sometimes at night. And I will see the same stocky hitchhiking figure walking along the side of the road in a black hoodie and jeans, with hood up, thumb out. I've never stopped, mind you, and he's never turned around when I've approached. I've seen him at every point in the day, dawn, day, dusk, night, I mean, I've seen him in locations several hours drive from each location as well. At first, I honestly thought that it was just a coincidence, but hitchhiking is really uncommon in our country. We're small and buses are really cheap, so to see this guy like that in so many different locations, something is definitely up. The next one... This is another reoccurring one, although it's newer. It's more annoying than anything else to be honest, but several times my partner and I have been woken to a long howl in our bedroom. Our windows are closed, apartment unit like I said, but it's ruining my sleep and I really enjoy my sleep, so this one is annoying. The next one, I'm actually thankful that it's resolved, but I had to deal with it over a series of years. To cut a long story short, whenever I was in the middle of a really tough case supporting someone in what we call spiritual warfare, I'd get a visit from whatever this was. It was the same every time, where I would have a dream of a cloaked figure, wake up to a spinning room, and I would be choking. I've had sleep paralysis episodes before, but this, this was definitely different. I'm still half convinced that this was some kind of sleep apnea issue or episode, the only thing that makes me think that it was paranormal is because it happened without fail when I dreamt of this figure and it stopped after I put some intentional work into stopping it. There are also some experiences of clients that unfortunately I cannot share because I've made a strict confidentiality agreement with them and that rests on my soul but generally speaking I've helped people deal with their psychological issues more than spiritual. Some spiritual ones have been fascinating and there's a feeling that I get when there's a real obvious sign of oppression or infestation. It's sort of like a heavy feeling on my chest and stuffy air sort of. I've helped people by blessing their houses which is a complicated process and depending on your beliefs can be somewhat risky. You essentially have to call forth the oppressing force, challenge it, rebuke it and either condemn it or suppress it if it can't be dealt with in one blessing. I've also helped people with deliverance, although I'm not really big on the evangelical deliverance ministry, we're a more traditional denomination, but I've never helped with an exorcism. I'm still relatively young for my role and while I am a commissioned member of the order, I'm not yet a fully fledged ordained minister or anything. So now to our processes. We have to be careful with what we share and that's for a really inane reason. We often get people who either want to play a prank or desperately want something paranormal to be happening and the information that we don't share is essentially the key information that we need while triaging our cases. What I can say though is how we view the paranormal is unusual. Anything paranormal by our theology is demonological, angelic or the Holy Spirit. When it comes to things that we humans get scared of, well, we're sort of hardwired to be scared of the paranormal if we believe in it. It's a an non-interactable nocturnal threat, and it's really easy to trigger our limbic system. However, and again, just my view, I see paranormal activity as parlor tricks of a, a damned and jealous entity. But I have the power to send it back where it belongs, and it knows that, so it will struggle however it can. It will try and scare me because it is scared of me. And really it should be because I'm there to do a job. It's sort of like a spiritual pest extermination I guess but 
A moving cup, whispering, growling, etc., etc., is nowhere as scary to me as, say, driving in heavy rain or the things that I've dealt with as a bouncer while I studied. Humans, dogs, even cats are more dangerous than most hauntings or paranormal experiences. One exception, though, is that possession is incredibly dangerous, but insanely rare, too. I'm not scared of these things. Not because I'm tougher or brave or anything, but because they're not really actually that dangerous, and they need to be condemned. That being said, if we go through an intensive investigatory sort of process, it looks a bit like this. So we're a medical order, we're also an indigenously focused arm of the order, and our perspective gives us a different worldview. When we assess a person, we don't just look at their spiritual health, we look at their social, physical, and psychological health as well. The first thing that we will do, fully funded, is have the person see a doctor and a psychologist for assessment. This isn't because we think that they're crazy, it's because we're building a comprehensive profile for exactly what we're dealing with. If someone is positive for physical or mental health issues that could be causing symptoms that they believe are spiritual, we need to treat those issues and see if the symptoms go away. Our church fully covers any costs associated with this process too. And if that doesn't solve the problem, my job is to definitively disprove the existence of paranormal activity or presences, but to do so while believing that there may still well be a presence. Skepticism is a good thing most of the time, but it's sometimes bad, I know that. We're not there to assume the issue is mundane. We take all the information that we can, assess it, and arrive at the likely outcomes. And we consider spiritual outcomes to be similar as likely as mundane ones. However, we still need to disprove all of the mundane theories that we can. But there's another layer to this, you see. Because we also need to prove all of the mundane theories too. This helps us have a quality of information. So we won't be happy to say, oh, it's probably just this mundane thing, unless we can prove that. After this, if there is persistence of a spiritual issue, we begin our church-sanctified process of blessings and protections for the affected individual. These interventions vary on intensity dependent on the person, their faith relationship, and the persistence of whatever that we're dealing with. I didn't take a, a standard pathway to this either. A standard pathway is that you attend a church that believes in demonological study, get as involved as possible with whatever you can, talk to the pastor about your desire to study and follow this pathway, and see if the church will support you. It's a long pathway though. You can also try to become a sort of lay chaplain for certain denominations. But honestly, the best thing that you can do is wholeheartedly commit to a church, show them that you're willing, and they'll support your journey. My pathway was that I studied a youth psych degree and specialized in youth gangs. Then a church was investing into the community and looking for a Christian with my expertise to be their youth pastor. I worked there for some time, and after a bit of a journey came back to my home denomination, and that's who I work for now. I got a master's in professional practice, chaplaincy, and a diploma in demonology. But my psychology knowledge is what sets me apart for this ministry in the eyes of the church. I'm much more equipped to do a referral assessment than many of the clergy or congregation. My training in demonology comes from several sources. I completed the diploma at Bible College, but have also done a small amount of training under a course from Bishop James Long. I did the Paranormal Academy of the United Kingdom online course because it's not Christian, and I trained under our Archbishop for some time to specifically respond to the needs of the community in this regard. As a chaplain, this calling fit under my purview in his eyes, and when I need to escalate church involvement, I go straight to him. He taught me our beliefs, blessings, the process of our church, etc. He also taught me our church's stance on demonology, which is really old school. We're Anglican. King James was a demonologist, so it's a particular field for us. And that's pretty much it. I'm always open to helping people on here, so if you have trouble, please just reach out through a message. I'm also happy to answer questions and engage in a discourse, although I'm not going to be entirely engaging in what-ifs from the stories. For me, it's almost impossible to prove the paranormal online due to the nature of evidence and how easily it can be faked, so I'm not going to get into that. 
And I've peer reviewed these things with my colleagues, so to me, I'm satisfied. But before finishing, I would like to offer a couple of more stories. So after I started to get more involved in spiritual guidance and conflict and intervention, we started noticing more stuff happening around the house. One thing that came to visit was a large dark figure. They were about eight foot tall. I'm six four, so tall in my own regard, but this thing was huge. It was coming from an underground storage next to our room. We were staying in a basement. After getting involved in a particularly nasty case, things started with knocking on the door from the underground storage area. But once a day at random times, we would hear a simple sort of knock three times. The area was a brick-walled room with dirt floors though, but there was no external access by either wind or people. We largely ignored it, and when the knock happened, if I was there, I would rebuke whatever was knocking by letting it know that it wasn't welcome. My partner, however, opened the door after the knocking but didn't tell me. She's not as spiritual as I am and she was curious to figure out what the knocking was. The next day, we were relaxing in bed when the guitar standing next to the door strummed twice incredibly loudly. Again, I rebuked but again, I didn't know that she'd answered the door. That night, I was struggling to fall asleep. I was tossing and turning and was frustrated so I opened my eyes to go to my phone. And when I did, roughly 20 feet away, I saw a huge black shadow figure standing in the corner looking at us. It was well built with broad shoulders and a strong looking body. I was frozen with shock at first and then I flashed my phone screen in its direction. It didn't disappear immediately though, which shocked me to be honest, but sort of slowly dissipated from the bottom upwards. I prayed in incantation and I went back to sleep. The next night though was the same. I struggled to sleep and had a feeling and when I was almost asleep I opened my eyes and again there was the figure except this time it was standing next to the door to the underground area. I grabbed my blessed tire, that's a Maori weapon, and stood then started to perform a fairly serious prayer this half woke my partner up, this matters soon too, and as I prayed in the darkness, the same thing happened. The figure slowly disappeared. The next day my partner asked what I was doing and I told her. I then asked her if she had seen anything and she said that she'd been hearing the knocking and tried to find the source. I asked her if she'd opened the door after knocking and she said yes. So I finally did what I should have, but was probably too scared to at the time in case I picked a fight that I couldn't win. I was new to all of this at the time, and blessed both our room and the storage room. I used frankincense and myrrh incense, holy water, and prayers in English, Latin, and my native Maori language. I placed an iron cross above the door on the inside of the house, and placed bigger wooden crosses above all of the entry points to my room, including that one. And, thankfully, I've had no problem since, and have gained a heck of a lot more confidence due to a lot more exposure. To this day, though, I'm not 100% sure what I was dealing with at that point. So, to be honest, I would really like to hear if anybody else has had experiences like this, to try and gain some more information and perspective on, perhaps, what it could have been. So I shared something about some howling at night and early morning too, not too long ago, and also said that I'd been thinking about skinwalkers, and I'd also been reading about them lately. Well, tonight, I was outside with my cousin helping him set up his new basketball hoop. We got finished with it, and he was shooting some hoops while I was watching, and it's about dusk at this point. Then he asks me if I want to go inside, and I say sure, and then all of a sudden I hear, help me, please help me, someone help. It sounded like a little girl crying for help near our pond. I was a bit shaken by that, and my cousin had already went inside the door but was waiting for me. At this point, I'm shaking because it's almost like I knew what it was as soon as I heard it. My cousin came back out and I no longer heard it. Then I'm shaking my way back inside to tell my fiancé... And she looks out the bathroom window because it's looking out towards the pond. 
and she sees a little girl out there. Then she tells me to come look. Not even 10 seconds later, and not even 10 seconds later when I get there, there's nothing there. What the heck is happening though? First it was knocking and howling, but we're having actual experiences now and I'm seriously starting to worry. Obviously I checked for any sign of an actual little girl and there was no sign of anyone out there. It wasn't a real little girl of that I'm sure and I know that it wasn't. I know who lives around this area in fact and I know what happens around here. It's not just some distressed kid. I know that. But I've been reading up on skinwalkers and also thinking about them. I'm about 60% native and also just had a child. Lots of negative things are going on in the family right now. It's pretty chaotic and it's feeding off of these things I think. Also, by the time that I got out there, there's no way that she would have fallen in the pond. And there was just no sign of anyone there anyway. There was no splashing in the water, no ripples, and also when I checked it this morning, there were no footprints or hair or shoes or clothes or anything either. It was muddy enough to see if someone had been there last night too. And I think I'm going to start to try and catch this stuff on camera to document it because obviously something weird is going on. So I've told my friends and family this story and they just look at me like I'm crazy. I also ended up telling my wife when we were moving out of the house that this happened in. I lived in Nevada with my wife in a newly constructed house that was three floors. The master bedroom was on the third floor and there was no door up to the master floor, it was just open. Sort of like a loft but it was a full sized area, not a converted attic or anything. This is pretty common in Nevada so that they can squeeze as many thin taller houses in a lot as possible. But anyway, one night, about a month into moving into the house, we're both asleep. I wake up in the middle of the night at around 2 or 4ish and see all the way at the other side of the room. What I can only describe is like a little creature, all black, and I couldn't make out any features or eyes or anything, but whatever it was, it was small. Maybe two feet tall, I would guess, and had two arms and legs like a person, but was sort of wider and didn't move like a person. It was unnaturally fast. It ran quickly to the edge of the bed, and then I could tell that it was looking right at me. I couldn't move, and I very consciously remember thinking, oh no, I do not have time for this. I remember it peered over the mattress and had a longer nose, but for some reason... It was not able or allowed to get on the bed or something. I watched it for about 10 seconds, then was like, okay, if it can't get up, then I'm just going to roll over. So I rolled over and nothing else happened that night. I know that that ending is pretty anticlimactic, but that's what happened to me that night. I never saw anything in that house again except for that one night. I was definitely awake and I could move, so it wasn't sleep paralysis. I've had that once and this was much worse and way more terrifying. And I guess I'm just wondering if there's a name for what I saw or if anybody else has had anything similar happen to them and what it was. So this happened to me in my early teens. I'm 21 now, and my best friend growing up had this huge farmhouse in the middle of Virginia. It was really old and beautiful, but also had a very dark history. In the house, there's a tunnel that leads to an underground room of sorts that was used for slaves to hide in the 1800s. And I'm 90% sure that some actually died down there while in hiding. So you can imagine the history and the energy that fills this house. I always felt scared there too. I never felt alone and wouldn't go anywhere alone in the house, even just to grab something out of my room. The room that I was staying in, obviously. Even the family was scared to stay there with no company because of the intense apparitions and also experiences, which I can get into another day. The rooms, though, were massive, and the entire house was white with, honestly, a sort of creepy vintage decor. There was even a cabinet of ventriloquist dolls upstairs. 
No, I'm not joking. They were a, a really old family, honestly, with lots of dark problems, but... Anyways, the second time that I visited that house, I was with my mum, my best friend at the time, and her mum. It was a girl's trip. One night, I woke up and was so thirsty, and the last thing that I wanted to do was go downstairs and get water. I mean, I was terrified like everyone else. I hated that house at night, but... My mum was pretty much dead asleep, so I literally sprinted downstairs with my head only looking at the floor. I made my water in five seconds, and when I made it to the stairs, something compelled me to look at the giant glass doors that were in front of the stairs. I was horrified, but I don't know, I just felt like I needed to look at the window. What I saw, too, when I looked at the window will haunt me for the rest of my life because... I saw a man, as real as anybody else that I'd ever seen before, standing there. It was pitch black outside with a huge bright moon. The man was all black like a silhouette, but because of the moon being so bright, I could clearly see his entire body. He was blacker than black, like he stood out so much that I 100% thought that he was a trespasser. He was wearing a top hat and was unhumanly tall like well over seven feet. My heart literally felt like it stopped beating, and for a moment I felt like I was in a trance of sorts. I was so unexpectedly horrified, but I couldn't look away. He was also moving a little bit, almost like breathing, I think. Then about ten seconds later, he was gone, disappearing into seemingly thin air. Well... I absolutely panicked and bolted upstairs after I snapped out of my trance, that is. I cried to my mum and was up all night, and I didn't get a wink of sleep after that. The next morning, I told my friend and her mum about the experience, and they were not shocked at all. As they had seen multiple full-body apparitions in the house themselves, they didn't seem to be fussed by it. I found out later too that the nanny that worked for them even refused to go into some rooms of the house after her own experiences. But after that, I never went back to that house ever again. This experience happened a while back, but I thought that I might as well share it on here for you guys to hear. So... Back in the mid-2000s, I lived in this house with my dad, my mum and my sister. Across the road from this house was this massive mansion which had a lot of residential turnover which my family, me included, believes is cursed. My sister and I were kind of scared of it to be honest because it was this big dark house that felt uninviting and cold. When my family moved into our house... There was a wealthy businessman living in the mansion across the road who moved in a few months before us. This guy was really rich, like think luxury cars, massive dinner parties with his rich friends, etc. Apparently, he owned a bunch of businesses, started a new business shortly after we moved in, and after almost six months of starting this business, he went bankrupt. He apparently lost everything. He sold all of his luxury cars, he had no more dinner parties, and... He also quickly became an alcoholic. He ended up selling his house because he of course couldn't afford it. But after he sold the house, a young recently married couple moved in. I have no idea how they afforded the house, but nonetheless they moved in and settled in quickly. My parents actually became quite good friends with them and we would have them over for dinner occasionally. They stayed in the house for about two years, but within that two years they had three miscarriages. The wife ended up becoming depressed and even had to be committed to a psych ward because she was thinking about deleting herself. These two incidences could be just classified as bad luck, I know that, perhaps unfortunate events, but the third one in my opinion solidifies that this house is cursed. So another couple moved into the house after the other couple decided to move and this couple were pretty wealthy. They hired a maid to stay in the house and to assist them with cooking and cleaning, etc. After a year of them living there, we once again got pretty close to this couple and would sometimes have them for dinner too and swim in the pool that they had as well. One night, my dad woke up and had a strange feeling. 
Apparently he heard something outside, so looked out of his bedroom window and saw the maid packing her car in the middle of the night. The couple that was living there was apparently away for the weekend and the maid was staying at the house by herself. He thought that it was weird and was a bit concerned but didn't think too much of it and went back to sleep. After he went back to sleep, he had a terrible nightmare that the maid ended up ending her own life in the garage of the house. He woke up in the morning a bit shaken from this dream and had a sort of sixth sense feeling. He decided to go over there and check if everything was okay. He rung the doorbell but didn't get an answer. So he decided to go around to the back of the house to see if the back door was unlocked. The back door was unlocked so he went in. He entered the living room and sure enough his dream had come true. He instantly ran home and called the police and ambulance but by the time that they got there and by that point it was too late. I remember seeing my dad after the event and he was as white as a ghost. Of course he didn't tell us what had happened as we were only young he ended up telling us when I was about maybe 15 or 16 or something and I don't really bring it up to him because he hates talking about it and gets really upset about the whole thing. We moved a little bit after the last event happened. I still have no idea what happened to the next family that moved in but I seriously hope that nothing bad happened to them. To this day though I am convinced that that mansion is cursed. So myself and three of my friends were all sitting in my backyard on my picnic table, the top of it so we were all facing the same way, looking up at the clear night sky one evening in the small town that we lived in. We had just left the bar and were chatting about our night and smoking a joint when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we saw something really big, all black, triangle in shape, with no lights whatsoever on it, appear in the night sky. It was a split second that we all saw it move from one end of the sky to the other and it covered the stars as it did this. It was absolutely massive, easily the size of a football field. All of us just looked at each other and exclaimed at the same time, did you just see that? It was honestly insane and something that I'll never forget. But then, a few weeks after the incident, I had a very vivid dream that I was on a very cold operating table with what I can only sense as beings that were not human and they were sort of tickling me each time that they touched me, almost like a, a faint electrical current. But there were more than one touching me in different places all at one time. It was weird because I could feel their physical touches while asleep like I was actually there. I wasn't able to see anything while this was going on. I'm pretty sure that I had something over my face so I couldn't see them or anything around me. However, I didn't feel threatened or scared by them at all, which was a bit strange because, honestly, I probably should have been. The dream ended abruptly and I woke up in my bed, but it seemed so real to me that to this day, I fully believe that maybe I was abducted while asleep so that they could study me. I've not seen the black triangle in the sky since or had any more abduction dreams, thankfully, but it was definitely one of the strangest occurrences for me to date. I'm wondering, though, if anybody else here has had a similar encounter. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full-time, so... I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents, who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mosheim near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives, and that area for a good many years as well. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story, and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area, after having spent the majority of my adult life in MN, being in and around the area, driving the same roads made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents. I had learned to shoot on the same 22 with which grandpa had taught mum, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or just spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. 
When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time that I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first, I honestly had no idea what she was talking about, but then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. There was some new context given by the experience adulthood provides, I guess. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. But before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hayfield, then the wood line. These woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home, and a good several miles to the back. I hated the hayfield because it was too pokey to play in, but I liked to hang out in a sort of creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property just in the wood line to avoid the hay. And while at my grandparents, the only rules were that I had to stay where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere that I went as well. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettable young age. And the best part of the crick was it was out of sight of the house. In fact, that was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water, splashing around, skipping stones, and just being a kid. But one day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank just watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I couldn't tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now as well, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt on, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist, and I thought of as a sort of Moses dress at the time, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories I heard growing up. Around his neck, there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string, in those knots were various pieces of mostly bones, but some flowers and bits of dark glass as well, it seemed. When I first saw him there, I was terrified. I was frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down in a kind of don't-stop-for-me wave. I didn't react at first. I think I was just sort of startled. Then he splashed at me, still smiling, he did it again. I splashed back and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks in the water and so did I. I pushed him. He pushed back. We carried on for some minutes until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man also stopped in his tracks, fixed his gaze toward the house. Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked at me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, and then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole time, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer because at the time I just didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, gripped like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began and I didn't really have new words. The event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain, I guess. Such silence further irked my grandma and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again when I started talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how he played and then he disappeared. I remember they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room. I was honestly happy to go, and happier still when grandpa didn't yell at me like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. 
I knew that that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Some I would actually throw them into the air like they're a clay pigeon or whatever. But these escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious now. Eventually he asked me how hairy was the man, really. I told him very, thinking that this was the right answer. He asked where, and I told him everywhere, like a bear. He ruminated on this, and I grew more nervous, worried I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble wherever it lie to end. So when he finally asked me to swear, in the name of Christ or on my mother, that I was telling the truth about everything, I said that I had been joking. He finally yelled, and then sent me back to my room. And after that, the family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everybody was upset with me and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was a bit lackluster. Even so, for a time I didn't go back there. In my memory, I stayed away for a long time, but I am sure that it was only a few days that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary aged self. When I did start going to the creek again, I took a bucket of toys, mostly Godzilla stuff, and a thick stick plucked from the wood line on the way. I think that I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the creek. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelt him. I scrambled away, leaving my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys, one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much at some point, and I started to lecture the man, telling him about how he got me in trouble, how he was a weirdo, how he stank. At some point, he stopped watching through my things and calmly watched my tirade, face still neutral, eyes analytical. Once I had concluded my lecture... I sat back under the tree to pout, having become hot in the sun. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, and when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree line until he turned, said something, not a word that I knew or know, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply, despite knowing that he wanted me to follow. After a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along the man making improving noises and putting on his smile again. Well, we went into the woods, the man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard to keep up. Eventually, he would stop when he lost me, knocking on the trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I may find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, though, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises at this point. And it was at this point that... I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place being behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. And on the back half... There rested the fly-covered carcass of squirrels, opossums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. 
On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklaces. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and a beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends. Dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square made from bound together sticks, just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another, he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a, a sort of bit of purple crystal it looked like. These he handed to me with an air of business and made a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground again for me to sit. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding that we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at recess. I didn't much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy, but the bucket was a huge loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things, I guess, but the man came back and gestured for me to follow by slapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times, but I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually, though, came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, but from out in the field. The man would not cross the creek at this point, but pushed me to do so. I did, but did not go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around to the opposite side. There, I laid in the shrubs by our front door pretending to sleep, and I was found. I swore that I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day, I went back to the creek to pick up my toys, and the man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water, or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have eaten, I know, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I still would eat, taken from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like he did on that first meeting. And at this point, you may be wondering why I'm sharing this story. And well, there are two more occasions that I wanted to account. One absolutely gruesome and the other was awful. So the eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks, but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box that I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent tinder. But during the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water and to the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore. The man, after stowing the bang snaps into the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked clean off. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit into his hand. The other came to a sort of flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. The thing struggled and bled as it was bisected, the dome eventually coming free, the turtle dropped eventually, to mingle everything with the dirt and the sand. The man rinsed the shell in the river, then offered it to me. In wordless horror, I just ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowing waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek, or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him that I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. 
The last time that we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cow tails, and from the woods, there came some whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. There were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious and felt comfortable with the man as a guide, so I did as asked. He took me back to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the woods. And waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless, wrapped at the waist. She was dirty with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap sort of partly but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed on me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do. I didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. And I learned under all that dirt that it was a her. The man then made a noise and drummed on the woman's bare back. The kid looked at him, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at the girl lazily. The man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl approached me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin but not emaciated, and slightly taller than me, should she have straightened up. The man and the woman fussed some more. Then the girl leaned close to me and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud now that it was all that I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair in one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity. Her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and sort of roomy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side, then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. At that, I'd had enough, and I ran. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground, but I didn't look back, and they didn't pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what happened. Wanting to just forget it, I guess. Not wanting to get into trouble either. Not thinking about the girl, the couple, what was intended for me. I just spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming that it was boring and lonely. Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call in the wind or the distant tapping of wood and I would always hurry inside. My grandma, though, could tell that something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in errands as he never had before. Eventually school started, classes and friends eased me away from the thoughts of the dirty man or the people in the clearing, and time must have done the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were of a family, I guess, but their features... White skin, brown eyes, brown hair are common enough that they all could have been unrelated, I guess. I'm sure that they lived together, though. They knew each other's signs and signals. They even used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people, wild men, and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin, and that through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone somebody. I guess though that I'm asking if people in my story are somebody someone, or if they may be known, 
or if their behavior rings any bells, bellies, any known intention. I figured that here, where the tale would not be discounted immediately out of hand, this might be the right place to ask some people. So, if you have any thoughts about this, then I would love to hear them. And thanks for listening. I still think about this every now and then. When I was in third grade, I had a friend named Rebecca. She had transferred to my school because she moved around a lot from foster home to foster home. So I didn't plan on creating a tight bond with her because I knew that she would have had to move eventually. Throughout the school year, she was my only friend though. She was somebody who truly understood me. I never felt understood until I met Rebecca in fact. She was the first person to introduce me to the paranormal whenever I would spend the night at her house. She would always tell me scary stories in the dark as she would shine a flashlight over her face. I really didn't believe the scary story she told me until, well, this one particular night. So we had just went to dinner and a movie with her parents. When I would spend the night, we would have a bedtime and it was 8pm, exactly on the dot. But Rebecca and I never followed that rule. Whenever we knew her parents went to sleep, we would go downstairs and watch some TV in the living room. So we did that, that one particular night. And as we sat on the couch, she started telling me that she would see this man and his dog every single night. He usually minded his own business and didn't speak. He would just wander around the house with his dog. Obviously, I was skeptical, but... As the night went on, I thought to myself that Rebecca was lying to me, just trying to scare me. You know how elementary schoolers are, they often have a bad habit of lying. But as we sat there on the couch watching TV, I looked behind me, and sure enough, there was this man with his dog going up the staircase. The man had a top hat and a tuxedo on, and his dog was what looked like to be a golden retriever of sorts. Rebecca didn't have a scared look on her face like I did. I remember being so scared that I had to sleep in my mum's room for a couple of weeks after it because the whole thing just really shook me. I never did keep in touch with Rebecca after she moved, but I hope she's doing well. My husband works at the Oregon State Hospital, a facility infamous for its past treatment of mental illness, and where the classic film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was shot. Despite its dark past, the facility had become a place of healing for many individuals suffering from mental illness. However, as with many older buildings, a portion of the asylum was scheduled to be demolished. As part of his cleaning duties, my husband ventured into the abandoned portion of the building, which had been devoid of any human activity for a considerable length of time by this point. As he worked, he couldn't shake the feeling that he was being watched. During his lunch break, he decided to call me to check in. I answered the phone and I could hear what sounded like people talking in the distance. However, the voices were muffled and indistinct. He sounded distracted and didn't seem to be listening to anything that I was saying. Irritated, I sort of snapped at him and asked if he was calling to talk to me or them. My husband was confused and quickly replied that he was alone in the building. My heart sank as I realized that something just wasn't right. There was a panic in his voice too that I had never heard before in our 19 years of marriage. After that experience, my husband was understandably shaken, but he continued to work at the asylum. He never had any other experiences like that again, but the memory of that day still very much creeps us out. I lived in this house for about seven years, and I have a lot of stories, so I apologize if this is a little bit long. I've tried to structure it in a chronological sense, as best as I can anyway. But for some background info, this is in a small town in central Texas. 
The house is a one story, three bedroom, two bath, with a front and back living room, a nice sized backyard, with a palm tree, gazebo, and a shed converted into a bar. It was right across the street from a Catholic church, cemetery, and after we moved out, we found out that the property used to be an orphanage in the 1960s, but shut down because before that, it was a funeral home with a crematorium that the orphanage was using to dispose of the bodies of the malnourished and abused children living there. We, me and my immediate family, were initially hired to clean up the house after the previous tenant trashed it. By trashed, I mean absolutely trashed it too. The carpet when we cleaned it was a light beige color, but it started out black. There were human-sized holes in the walls as if someone was slammed repeatedly all through the house. Dead chickens and other animals were all over the floor, along with black candles, pentagrams on the walls and floor, and some mystery blood smeared on the back closet of the master bedroom as well. How did we feel comfortable enough moving in after we found all of that? Well, when it was cleaned up, it was a really nice place, and the rent was only $450 a month. We should have known just based off of the low rent, but I digress. So, the first incident. It was our first day in the house. I had most of my stuff in already, so my parents told me to wait at the new house while they went to our old house with my siblings to get some more stuff and all that. I decided to take a nap after putting a few things on my dresser. In the center of the dresser, I put a Mary candle my mum had given me. Might be important to note too that the most satanic stuff was found in the master bedroom that had a walk-in closet, a dressing room, and its own bathroom. This room became my room because everybody else was too scared to even set foot in it, including my parents. The whole seven years that we lived there, the only time anybody else but me set foot in that room was before we moved in while we were cleaning the house. My little brother got the middle room and my little sister got the room next to his at the end of the hall next to the other bathroom and my parents opted to turn the back living room into their bedroom. So after arranging my stuff on the dresser, I laid on my bed to take a nap while waiting for my family to return with more stuff. When not two minutes after I shut my eyes, the candle slid off the right side of the dresser to the floor with a thud. I was a little bit freaked out, but as I was by myself, I tried not to let it get to me too much, rationalizing it, saying that it was the wind or my dresser is crooked or slanted or something. I checked the dresser by pulling it away from the wall a smidge and putting a ball in the center to see if it rolled, and it didn't. Then I checked all the doors and the windows to make sure that there wasn't a draft or anything like that. I put the candle back in the center and I laid back down, when, not even a minute or so after, I shut my eyes. The candle slid off the left side this time, like someone was sliding it and it fell. I literally said nope, and I ran outside and waited on the porch until my family got back. When they questioned why I was outside because it was summer and Texas is really hot in the summer, I replied that I wanted some fresh air and sun, trying to play it off so that they wouldn't think that I was crazy. Now, the second incident, this was after we had been living there for a few months. I was asleep in my room with the door open because it made me feel better, and the rest of my immediate family were gathered in my sister's room down the hall, telling each other ghost stories as it was close to Halloween at this point. My mum said something along the lines of, you all better stop telling that stuff before something happens. And right after she said that, my door slammed shut with so much force that it shook the entire house. I instantly started screaming. Side note too, when I was younger, I used to sleep talk or walk a lot, especially if there was paranormal activity in the house, as this wasn't the last time that we lived in a haunted house, unfortunately. My mum urged my stepdad to go and check on me, but he just said, you go and check on her. So eventually they both came to check on me and... They said that once they opened the door, they saw me sitting up in my bed with my eyes open but glassy and not focused on anything. And apparently I kept saying, get off of me, help. They were too scared to enter the room, so from the door they switched on the light and said, get out. At that moment, they said that a black sort of cloud seemed to lift off of me and I fell back in the bed with my eyes closed, fast asleep. 
I don't remember any of that, but what I do remember is waking up and them freaking out. But they freaked out and left me there because apparently they were too scared and told me about it in the morning. I knew that they weren't lying too because the dream that I had the night before matched up with what they were saying and they both sort of looked kind of pale when they were telling me. So they were scared and they just left me in there apparently. I'll probably end up sharing a part two later as there's a lot more, but any additional information needed or any questions, please do ask below as I'm happy to share more. I think that I was somewhere between 10 and 12 when this happened, but I do remember it pretty well. So I was very adventurous as a kid, still am now to be honest. I was always outside, wasn't at my house too much, especially around this time as my parents were going through a divorce and everything was about them and us children were somewhat neglected. We lived in a really nice suburban neighborhood though that had a lot of trees and curvy hilly windy blocks that were quite a lot of square miles, really big, maybe a hundred or so but I could be way off. Basically we had a lot of space to explore though is what I'm getting at. I was with my four friends during the summer. Middle of the day, we were walking back to go to someone's house after playing some baseball or something. Two of us had scooters and went ahead of us a little ways and two of us were walking, trailing behind. At one point, our scooter friends get to the end of the block and turn around to wait for us, slowpokes, just walking. And I remember getting a really strange feeling, but at the time I didn't really know up from down, so I barely recognized it. They're both looking back at us, kind of concerned, which I think triggered that feeling. But then one of them shouts, guys, run. I look at my friend like, why would they want us to run right now? He says it again with more force and gave me a slight fright, run. So I thought, all right. But we start running full speed towards them. It really wasn't that far away, maybe a hundred feet, and stopped when we got to them. Why did you want us to run? Apparently, a car drove by us slower than normal with purple tinted windows and turned around the corner and disappeared. And that car had slowed down and was pulling over and someone had opened one of the doors and my friend said that they could see someone there like they were getting ready to try and grab us. I don't remember seeing that part happen but I do remember the very eerie vibe of the car so... I'm fairly certain that they weren't lying. I thought that I remembered that same car parked in a nearby driveway at one point, like maybe they lived there and it was their lot, but I was never sure if it was that exact car or not. In any case, having good friends like this that look out for you, it may just save your life, like perhaps it did mine. I've been staying at my aunt's house for a week or so while they're on retreat with each other and all was well for the first six days and then I find that the back gate is wide open. Not that wouldn't really worry me for one but to access that gate in particular you have to go past a six foot tall sliding gate. The house is right off the road downtown so the driveway is on the side of the house and the garage is basically in the backyard. But once you go into the big sliding gate, you pull up right in front of the garage and next to the house. To get to the back door and go inside, there are two side gates that go off to the back area. One gate leads to the backyard and the other leads to the back door. Now, I have not touched the one that leads to the backyard the whole time that I've been there. And well, I worked the night shift and I arrived home at 11.30. I got home. I know for a fact that the gate was not open when I left because my dog was trying to get out of that gate and I told her no and to come to the gate that I was using. I got home and, well, it was about 2am when the dog starts fussing and I was like, I guess they might have to go potty. So I walked outside and the dog starts barking like crazy. No big deal, I mean, they do it every time they go out pretty much, but then I look to my left and see that the second gate was wide open. At that, my heart sank because I knew that I didn't open that gate, and it was closed when I returned home not even three hours ago. I called my parents and told them the situation, and they're not that concerned. 
I check the entire house, all the closets, under the bed, and nobody is in the house and nothing looks awry. Though I am jumping at every sound their cat and two dogs make. I'm scared and I want to leave, but also scared to return outside to my car. I have very high anxiety and panic attacks and I'm feeling one coming on, so I know all the doors are locked. Though none of their windows have curtains, so anyone outside can easily see inside. But I need some reassurance. So I sit back in my room with all the dogs around me. And, long story short, I packed all my stuff up and I was just sitting on the couch with the dogs when I noticed police lights outside of the house in front of the next door neighbor's house. I walk outside with all of my stuff locking the front door of the house. I went over to the cops and asked them to escort me to my car because I felt unsafe. And it turns out the cops are there at the neighbor's house due to reported suspicious activity. Three men escorted me to my car and I got the heck out of Dodge. My gut was telling me that something wasn't right that night and obviously something was not right because cops were at the next door neighbor's house. I'm now safe and I got off the phone with my brother and I'm almost home but something was going on there that night and I just felt like I was being watched. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon and around 9.30 or 10 at night, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. But we sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But towards the end of the conversation, we started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before and I understand that when you talk about things like this, it puts you in a very specific type of headspace. All night I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. So... We started walking back to camp and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road you see the entrance to the campsite and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front and I don't believe the doors and the windows are shuttered but they're definitely not accessible. Like, I wouldn't be able to press my face against a window and try to peek in. It's that kind of boarded up. So, I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes and we were talking about his story and I was trying to debunk it and figure out with him when all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both really didn't think too much of it because we had already seen two people walking that night and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl, she walks up to the abandoned building and looks as if she's peering into the window or trying to open the door on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tippy toes. She obviously doesn't get in and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building right in front of us to the left side. And this is when I start to get uncomfortable because she doesn't look at us or address us or even though we're loudly standing there talking and the way that she was walking, all I could see was like her side or back profile in a sort of long brown ponytail. I know this doesn't make much sense, but it's like how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair and... It's not like she had her head turned, if that makes sense. Anyway, she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come out. At this point, I'm actually invested and am grilling the location she went to the whole time and don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there and was waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge on the side of the building that looks maybe, I don't know, three or four inches wide. Kind of like a gutter hanging off, I guess. And I swear on my life that it's like she went behind this little four-inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was frozen and just watching us. 
Shane has his spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight, and he shined it on the little edge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge, and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and screamed, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where he thought that she would pop out, and after a delayed four or five seconds, we literally saw her sprinting out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back haunched over, so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would. And I cannot explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place. And once we shine the flashlight, we have this person's face pop out from the side of the building. It legit would have been less scary if she never came out and we circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural and it was as if no human being would respond with her body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It's like she couldn't figure out what to do and she showed herself only because we made her. It was almost as if she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong. Not scared of us, I guess you could say. But the way she popped out, her face turned towards us and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis arms or something. And I know that this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. But neither one of us saw a face on this woman. It was just smooth skin or sort of clay colored, rounded and with no eyes or facial expression. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We thought it was just our minds playing tricks on us or something. But this is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit, so bear with me. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns his flashlight off when I asked him to because I felt like it was rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off and I can see her extended body about three feet off the ground, as if she's crouching and reaching out at the same time. It was almost like she was going to take like a, an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulls herself back behind the ledge and stands up straight and starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time now and she just says, oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make sense why she needed to change in that specific spot of all places. The strange part though is that I specifically heard her talk about changing and Shane heard her say something about just having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that that's what she was doing because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left side of the building across to the right and back down the trail towards the campground... She kind of scurried away quickly as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing too is that, again, I didn't see her face the entire time that she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail when I should have been able to see her face. After she slowly walked back down the road towards the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how weird that was. The whole interaction and that we need to get back to our own site, and he told me that this person had a short blonde bob or Karen-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that she had a long brown ponytail because he hadn't seen that color anywhere on this person. I guess that's one of the really weird things too, because there's just absolutely no way that one of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other Anyway, as we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of dark trees that, as a female, would definitely have peed or changed behind. And it's like this building was so far out of the way and I would never think to go so distant to the right side of the building like that. Late at night as well, in order to change my clothes? It was weird. What I mean is that it just didn't make any sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in like New York, New Orleans, Denver or whatever and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we could chalk it up to the person being high and just kind of laugh it off. 
But this is a random, quiet family campground where everybody is super happy and peaceful. Sure, we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on, but even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to her body movements, plus the smooth face that we both saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up, not when she didn't notice us sitting there, not when she looked in the window, not when she walked across the building, not when she dipped behind the ledge, not when she peered out, not when she crouched down, not when she replied to us, and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that I had tears in my eyes and it had me shook, but I was so incredulous at the same time because I just couldn't believe it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it already happened and I just had to sit there and process that I really saw what I did. We talked about NPCs sometimes and we joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real and we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels but this was something else entirely. This was something that seems like, I don't know, a lower form or less intelligent than us sort of being that was pretending to be a human. I know that sounds crazy and weird, but I feel like I should add too that this is a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with stories of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. But I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us, this didn't seem like something with an emotional intention, it, it didn't seem quick or cunning or like it wanted something from us. This was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. I have no idea what its intentions were or why it was here of all places or why it presented itself to us that night, but I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that, well, this happened. Also, I should probably mention that we aren't too sure how much this plays into it either, but we're coming from New Orleans and we're having really strange experiences there. Not like with people per se, but it felt as if sometimes the streets would shift or change. It was weird and certain places would make us feel uncomfortable or cause our emotions to be super intense. There was a graveyard and a church we ended up sleeping next to and that gave us constant nightmares and made us feel like we couldn't fall asleep and as if something was looking in our windows all night. In fact, I heard a voice in the same spot one night that foreshadowed our cat getting killed. We heard weird animalistic roars coupled with sort of a metallic banging and clanging while we were falling asleep. The wind was blowing our curtains violently around on the right side of our bus while the left side curtains were completely untouched while our blind husky, who usually sleeps all through the night, was sitting up with her ears perked up, staring at the window. It was all just getting too much to bear and we felt like the city was trying to take something from us. So we got out of there to go on vacation to this campsite on the beach and we aren't sure if we bought something along with us or not. We're trying to piece it all together, as you can obviously tell. Also, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but it was still part of our night last night. As we were walking back down the boardwalk towards the main road, we were stopped by an older woman who wanted to talk to us about our husky and ask Shane where he was from. I was busy trying to keep the dog on the trail and kind of walked a little bit faster and was going to keep continuing, not in a sort of rude way, but just not really wanting to make small talk sort of way. But she kind of made me stop and turn around and she asked me where I was from too and I told her New York. We made small talk about van lifting and whatnot and she asked our names and when I said Naomi she said, Oh my grandson's name is Noam, that's the male version of Naomi. And I told her that that was really beautiful, I, I never heard that before and she told us her name is Pat and I was like, Wow, that's wild, that's my mum's name, Patricia. And she said, well, you guys can call me Pat or Patricia and maybe I can come over and check out your bus tomorrow. It looks like you really did a beautiful job. We exchanged pleasantries and wish each other a good night. But when Shane and I got to the picnic table, we were just kind of spacing out and talking about how interesting of an interaction that she had the same name as my mum and I had the same name as her grandson and, and how this was a really beautiful but random coincidence and... 
Then we thought that, well, maybe it wasn't so random after all. Pat had already walked back to the campground, and this was just before the woman above came by. I, a 40-year-old female, went to the university at Buffalo, fresh out of high school in the early 2000s. At the time, the online world was a, a bit like the Wild West, which included having to do quite a bit more digging to find specific information than today's split-second Google search. As such, it was a much easier time for colleges and universities to hide or spin campus crime statistics to make themselves look better for prospective wallets, I mean students. Case in point, I was at an orientation a month or two before my freshman year, and one of the mass presentations I had to attend was about campus safety. Bright-faced, upperclassmen orientation aides enthusiastically and verbally filleted the school, boasting about how North Campus was in, at the time, the safest town in the country, Amherst, New York, and that the only murder in recent history has occurred nine years ago to an unfortunate student named Linda Yellum, who was murdered on the campus's bike path during a lone early morning run. It was a fate that we were assured could be avoided by simply not hitting the bike path alone. What they conveniently didn't reveal was that A. The killer hadn't been caught, and B. Yalom wasn't his only victim. He was a serial rapist and eventual serial killer who had already been active in the area for at least 25 years in downtown Buffalo, and on the secluded bike paths of the Buffalo suburbs too. In retrospect, had this information been as readily accessible as it is now, it probably would have kept me from the most bone-chilling encounter of my life. So, fast forward three years. I was a very depressed 20-year-old who was struggling with her sexual identity and her parents' reaction to it in a much less accepting time than now. I'd left school and, to avoid being home, shacked up with a woman who'd promised me the world but then rejected me in favor of her ex-girlfriend on the night that I moved in, and eventually turned out to be a felon who drained vulnerable would-be love interest bank accounts though that's a very convoluted story for another time. So clearly, I was an unhappy young adult, desperate for love and a sense of belonging, sometimes to my own detriment. Despite my roommate's many kind and hurtful gestures, I stuck with it in the naive hope that she would eventually come around and fulfill her pie-in-the-sky promises to me. On a particular July night, that hope just fell flat. I was at Roxy's Green Room, a now defunct lesbian bar and club that many wayward buffalo lesbians, myself included, flocked to at night to feel a much needed sense of community and to hopefully lend a special someone. Since the latter just wasn't happening for me, and since I didn't yet know what kind of person she really was, I was still stuck on my roommate. She liked to dangle emotional carrots overhead out of some sick joy that she got from making me hurt, but also hang on to hope and... After a promise to hit Roxy's alone with me and talk about us, she showed up with her ex turned current and shut me out. I was wounded and upset enough to leave at around 1 in the morning, well before the 4am last call that I was still young and spry enough to stomach and without a ride home like my usually wiser self would have secured, I left. While my apartment on Delaware was walking distance from Rocky's, it was a good half an hour walk. And being as emotionally charged as I was, I angrily hoofed it down the main street sidewalk, still managing to follow the pedestrian rule of walking against the traffic, despite stupidly ignoring a rule that I knew well from years of watching forensic shows. If you're a woman, never leave a bar at night alone, especially if you're walking. I got exactly halfway home when a dark green sedan started driving toward me. I didn't think much of it until the car slowed down near me as I walked. A lone, middle-aged man was in the car with a skin tone that I originally associated with a guy being Italian, but in retrospect, he could have easily been Puerto Rican. He had dark hair and, most importantly, almost impossibly dark eyes that seemed to hold no light of good intentions. Now, I was used to guys being pigs at times. I'd been catcalled by downtown construction workers when an ex-girlfriend and I shared a kiss, and I had endured all matter of wholly unwanted graphic and ham-fisted advances from dudes at school. And although I'd never take the stance that I was asking for it or anything, 
I was young and thin, so I was dressed in a tight, red crop top with a flare-legged black spandex pants. The get-up was meant to turn women's heads, so I wasn't exactly surprised that I caught the attention of the wrong sex. I paid it little mind past mild irritation that a guy old enough to be my dad would look at me like that as the guy drove off and turned at the next intersection behind me. My walk resumed. I put the guy out of my mind and I continued my trek. But that peace, it didn't last. About two or three minutes later, I see a similar green car coming up on me again. This time, the guy's window was down a bit and he shouted, hey, in a sort of beckoning manner, and gestured in a way that made me wonder if he thought that I was a, a lady of the night or something. Now, that incensed me. Despite my recent struggles with my identity and the resulting entropy in my life, I was always a good kid. I flashed him a quick annoyed look to inform him that despite the mildly revealing clothing, he was barking up the wrong tree for several reasons and then I ignored him, focusing forward. He sped off again and then he turned again. At that point, it was clear that the dude was casing me like a cat burglar cases a house. It was before the time of Uber or even widespread use of cell phones, and with no cabs passing by, I had little hope of getting one. Public transit existed, but it was both sparse and not running nearby. The stretches of Maine between intersections were long, and I'd probably be spotted on them anyway since the guy was circling. Being 15 minutes away from Roxy's and my home, there was also no way that I could get anywhere near either place before the green car came back around again. So I quickly thumbed through my mental rolodex of true crime show inspired safety tips that should have kept me out of this situation in the first place. Like tip one, get to an open business, inform the clerk, have him or her call the police and stay put. Then the guy would either give up or get caught. I was coming up in the convenience store where on the opposite side of the street where I'd bought a pack of cigarettes earlier in the night. But as I got closer, the desolate blackness through the windows told me that it was closed. I looked around for something else, another bar, a gas station, anything, but the street was flanked by shuttered brick buildings and a locked up church. And then came the headlights and green again. Again, the guy slowed down as he approached me, but his demeanor had shifted again. He put his palm out impatiently as if he couldn't understand my lack of complicity. Come on! The guy yelled through his now open window, his face an equal picture of aggression, intimidation, and frustration. I kept out of arm's reach on the sidewalk and once again ignored him, but this time I was properly shaken. He angrily punched the gas and was off on his familiar circuit back around to me again. Now I knew that I was in trouble. The guy's behavior was escalating and I was genuinely scared that his next move would be to grab me off the sidewalk and pull me into his car. From there, God only knew what sort of depravity I was in for. I scrambled through my memory for another safety tip, and I remembered that making myself both impossible to ignore and obviously in distress could get me some much-needed attention from an outside party. So I ran into the middle of Main Street and started frantically waving my hands and shouting at every car that was coming my way. The first car drove by. The second car drove by. The terror in me was now palpable. I knew the stories of city dwellers who were left to their horrible fates at the hands of monsters by jaded throngs of people who heard the attacks perpetrated on them and their cries for help but did nothing out of both an assumption that someone else would step up and reluctance to get involved. And I wondered, would I be the next victim of the bystander effect, snatched away to an early end because of big city indifference? As I was beginning to lose hope, but still determined to keep trying while thinking of my next bold move, a van pulled over that had four black guys in it. As a white woman, I was relieved. I knew that statistically, male predators overwhelmingly tend to prey on women of their same race. In a game of numbers, this van full of guys was exponentially safer than that single stalker in the green car. So, I opted to take the gamble. I frantically told them about the man in the green car who kept circling around the block and following me and begged for a ride home. The driver asked if I had any money in exchange for the favor. I didn't. Then he asked if I had any cigarettes. I may be one of the only people you'll ever meet who actually had her life saved by smokes too, but 
Though I had never been a smoker before, I briefly picked up the filthy habit because New York State bars still allowed smoking, and it was a weird part of Buffalo lesbian bar culture that I emulated to fit in. Yet another way that I was, as are many, kind of an idiot in my early 20s. But yes, I answered urgently. I just bought a pack and you can have the whole thing if you get me home. Adamantly, I was initially a little miffed that the driver wanted something from me in exchange for not letting me get abducted off the street, as well as the implication that he may not have helped me if I had nothing. Still, I had the Malboros, and he had a vehicle, and the stars had hopefully aligned. Regardless of how it went down, I had help if he let me in, and the details didn't matter. After a second or two of thought, which seemed like an eternity to me, the driver agreed and one of the two dudes in the back opened the side door for me and got out so that I could slide into the seat behind the driver. As the door to my safe carriage full of impromptu nights shut and I got buckled in, I looked out of my window just in time to see the green car creeping past the van and proving to my saviors that I was telling a very disturbing true story. And until my dying day, I will never forget that man's eyes. Feeling safe surrounded by a closed van full of young, tough-looking rescuers, I looked at this guy dead in the eyes. Part of me was rightfully terrified, but another part of me wanted to look right at him defiantly and tell him with my eyes, I got away from you, I win. I was repaid with the most evil, hateful look that I'd ever had directed at me, let alone seen. His eyes were black black like a cat's eyes get when it sees a bug in the house and its hunting insects causes its pupils to blow to allow more light in. But at least there's usually a hint of playful mischief in a hunting cat's eyes. The eyes that I was seeing were those of just pure, unadulterated predator, and the vitriol that practically oozed from them as he glared at me let me know exactly how he felt about his prey, having the audacity to elude him. He drove off into the night, and so did we, in a bit less direct route to make sure that we lost him. After a blessedly quick jaunt with frequent looks behind my shoulder, I was delivered home, one pack of cigarettes short but alive and in one piece. The first thing that I did when I got in the door was to check the locks on absolutely everything. After that, the adrenaline started to wear off and the pure fear set in. I was so terrified that the man in the green sedan was searching the area when I got dropped off that I grabbed the cordless phone, then lay completely flat on the living room floor for hours to keep totally out of sight from any of my apartment windows. As I lay there, I called the Buffalo police and relayed my terrifying tale in as much detail as I could give them. Being painfully aware of the prevalence of hate crimes against the LGBT community at the time, I told the cops that it was possible that the man was cruising near Roxy's to prey on vulnerable queer women who were out and about. In hindsight, I think the guy just saw who he thought was an easy mark out by herself and availed himself of the opportunity to strike. So, fast forward another four years and I'd moved out to Chicago to live with my then girlfriend. For about half of my four years there, I was pretty homesick I admit. I'd never lived anywhere except my home state of New York, and I went there knowing no one accepted my ex, who wasn't exactly an empathetic soul, adding to my feelings of isolation. I coped by keeping up on upstate New York news, so I'd feel a little less far away, I guess. But on a chilly mid-January morning in 2007, I was at our computer looking up headlines from my home state when one from the WBFO popped up that immediately snared my attention bike path rapist is arrested. By then, I knew the moniker well. The internet had since aged into a beautifully organized repository of sometimes knowledge, and despite the lack of transparency from my alma mater, I became familiar with the Buffalo area mystery man and his active status throughout my time in Buffalo. And now, I had a name for the spectre responsible for that bit of eeriness that was always in the back of my mind when I was a student. The bike path rapist was revealed as Altemio Sanchez, a middle-aged native of Puerto Rico who coached his son's sports teams and was affectionately referred to as Uncle Al in his neighborhood. As with many other killers, his disguises were his community involvement and just being ordinary. The man was estimated to have been responsible for 9 to 15 rapes around the Buffalo area since 1975 and had confessed to three murders 
the Yala murder in 1991, a second in 1992, and a third which had occurred only three and a half months prior to this capture. And I don't know if you've ever felt your heart somehow get wedged up into your voice box and get dropped into the depths of your stomach simultaneously, but believe me when I say that it's possible given the right catalyst. For me, that catalyst was the printed proof that the man was active while I lived in Buffalo and frequented Roxy's. More so, I knew that serial killers rarely take breaks as lengthy as the one between his 1992 and 2006 killings. He had to have at least been attempting to satiate his evil impulses for those 14 years. And that realization gave me a very, very bad feeling that I'd crossed paths with someone much more dangerous than I'd realized. The news article had no picture of Sanchez, but this sickening feeling in me prodded me to find one. And it was almost as if I knew what I would see before I even looked at him. I Yahoo searched his name because that was still a respectful means of finding things on the internet in 2007. And I was horrified, though not surprised, to see those same black soulless predatory eyes that I looked into four times on that summer night in Buffalo in 2003. The timeline fit. My profile as a victim fit. In fact, the fact that he had mistaken me for a downtown prostitute and barring all else, I knew those eyes. I had a potentially deadly close encounter with Artemio Sanchez, the bike path rapist, aka the bike path killer. My lack of sense put me in his orbit and a van of angels pulled me out of it. I know who I saw and as God is my witness, I will never be convinced otherwise. Though many of his rapes fell victims to statutes of limitation, he pled guilty to the three murders and was sentenced to 75 years to life in prison. In essence, the guy won't be exposed to the outside again unless he's the one in a body bag. My boyfriend, male 20, and I, a female 21, live alone and we both work weird hours. He leaves for work at around 10.30pm and I leave at around 4am. It's starting to get cold outside and I drive a 30 year old Honda so it takes a while to warm up. Now one morning I went outside at around 3.45am to start my car so that it would be warmed up by the time that I was leaving for work. When I went outside to start my car too... There was nobody else outside and no other cars that I could see besides the ones parked in my neighbor's driveways. There was not a car parked in front of my house at all and then at 4am it was time for me to leave. I got all my stuff ready and was walking to my car and as I'm walking I hear a man yell, hey. I ignored it because obviously it's 4 in the morning and dark outside and I'm a female. But I noticed his car was parked directly in front of my house which is honestly weird to me by itself. So then again he yelled, hey, but it was a bit louder this time. I still refused to even look in that direction and I pretended that I didn't hear him. He yelled over and over again, hey, can I get a jump, asking me to jump his car. He kept getting louder each time and seemed like he was starting to get frustrated, I guess. At this point, all I was thinking was this guy was not out here 15 minutes ago. How did he suddenly pull up and his car died conveniently right in front of my house, all within 15 minutes? So anyway, I continued to pretend like I didn't hear him, got in my car and immediately locked the doors and left. As I was driving away, I kept my eyes on the mirrors and when I got about maybe a block and a half away, I saw his car start up and he drove away perfectly fine. It didn't look like he needed a jump at all, in fact. So, why was he asking me for a jump if his car would start up just fine? What would have happened if I actually did try to go and help this guy? I know that I could be overreacting, but to me the whole situation seemed very suspicious. My grandma always said a man would never ask a woman for help, especially with a car, and... My boyfriend said one time that he wouldn't even approach a female at night just for the simple fact that it might make them uncomfortable. I told him what happened and he said that it was very weird as well. I don't know if it could have been a trafficking tactic, a kidnapping tactic, etc. But it was definitely strange. 
One of my friends joked that someone could be watching my house and I get that they were trying to be funny and lighten the mood, but it's definitely kind of scary when you have an experience like that. Especially because if someone was watching my house, they would know that I was completely alone for a few hours at night. Anyway, do you guys have any thoughts? I'm still trying to wrap my head around this and figure out if I'm just overreacting or not. This was just a few nights ago and honestly I've been kind of scared of going out to my car or just being alone in general at night since then. I guess I'm just wondering if maybe somebody is watching my house. And if they are, what should I do? So this is the strangest thing that I've ever seen and it was somewhere in West Virginia years ago. I was hiking through the woods off trail and at some point I came across a really random field that was quite large that was clearly someone's farm. I was about to go around it too until I noticed a bunch of people wearing what looked like cloth diapers and head wraps while burning a cross with a pig hanging from a chain. They were speaking in a language that I didn't recognize. They saw me, we both sort of had a deer in the headlights moment look for what felt like forever, but then a, a few started my way, and I have never run back up a mountain in the dark so fast for so long. I still have no clue what they were doing, I don't think that I could find that place again if I wanted to to be honest, but what I can say is that West Virginia has some weird people in it. This was about four or five-ish years ago, and back then, I lived with my mother in a shed on a farm surrounded by woodland. Our farmland was a part of a large piece of farmland that was split up and sold off, so we did have neighbours, though they were roughly half a kilometre away each. We loved that though because of the privacy. It wasn't like there was nobody nearby that I couldn't go to if I needed help too. And that thought is what had me fearlessly walking alone at night between the hours of 7 and 8 p.m., sometimes fluctuating from earlier to later depending on the day. Sometimes I even went out on a walk at 2 a.m. in the morning because I was restless and I just couldn't sleep. Looking back, this was incredibly stupid, I know that. And after this incident, I never walked after 6 p.m. ever again, always making sure that there was at least some sunlight left when I set out. So... The route that I always took was a road circuit. The first part was out in the open in front of all the other farms, including my own. If anything had happened, at least one person would have noticed and reception was pretty good so I would have also been able to call someone. The second half on the other hand was concealed by about 200 meters of woods between the farms and the back road, stretching the full two kilometers at the back of the farm and it was during that part of the walk when I had this creepy encounter. So, it was late at night. I can't remember what time exactly, but it was pitch black, with the exception of my torchlight. I was about to approach the turn in the loop that would bring me out to the open again when I heard it. Help. It was this sort of monotone voice that repeatedly asked for help. It didn't seem panicked in the least. I took my headphones out and turned my music off to make sure that I was hearing correctly, but it didn't stop. Help, help is what it said. A very stupid part of me almost responded too, because for some reason my first instinct was, oh no, someone's in trouble, like a naive kid, even though I would have been like 16 or 17 at the time. Of course, then my brain kicked in and I realized that approaching that voice was just about the stupidest thing that I could do, so I started quietly backing away. Unfortunately, my cat had followed me on the walk and wasn't backing away with me. No, she was walking towards the voice, softly hissing. I remember desperately trying to get her back to come towards me without alerting the voice to my presence, just in case they hadn't noticed me yet. But I was getting scared and didn't want to stay there a moment more, so I ran towards her, grabbed her, then turned around and bolted back towards my house. I don't know if it was stupid of me to turn my back to the voice as I was making so much noise while running that there was no way they didn't know that I was there and I had no way of knowing if they were giving chase or anything too. I was just completely terrified that whole time. 
The image of someone cloaked in shadows chasing me entered my mind, and even though I couldn't hear anyone behind me, I never once slowed down until I was back safe and sound within my house. But it doesn't end there, though. You see, despite how terrifying it was, there was still a part of me that was concerned about whoever it was, because what if they really did need help? So I asked my mother to drive us to the location, another very stupid decision considering what we found, that being nothing. We called out and called out, but nobody ever answered. We didn't get out of our car, obviously. Luckily, neither of us were that stupid, I guess you could say, but we drove home having seen nothing and no one. But it still bothered me in the morning, so I had my mother drive us over again and we searched the immediate area. Nothing, though. No indication that anyone had even been there. There was no body, which admittedly was a drastic thing to search for, I know, but I know shock can leave you eerily calm, which could have explained the monotone voice and the lack of response afterwards, which made me fear that we'd been too late and that we'd find a body in the morning or something. I don't know if I would have preferred this outcome, to be honest, because at least then I would have had a, a face to the voice. But no, we found absolutely nothing, not even tracks. And to this day, I have no idea who that voice belonged to and why they were monotonously calling out for help. My mind has naturally come to some, I guess you could say, chilling conclusions and theories that leave me unable to sleep. Like maybe it was a, a rapist, a kidnapper, a serial killer or something. All the classic horror stories, but I guess I'll, I'll just never really know for sure. So I know that we've all had, like, bad dates, right? But this, this is the only date that I've had to date that rang every alarm bell and waved every red flag. I'll preface this by saying that I don't really go on many dates, but when I do, I make sure that I follow safety protocol by only meeting my date in public areas, let either my family or friends know where I'm going, and park in a populated place close by to wherever we meet. Anyway... This date initially suggested that we meet at his house to watch a movie and have a few drinks and I said no, I don't feel comfortable with that and I only want to meet in public. He seemed okay with this but then brought it up a few more times and I said if money is an issue that we could meet up another time or forget about it altogether. But my date backtracked and went with my idea of meeting at a cafe that I chose, that I was familiar with and equidescent to where we both lived. So, he turns up in a two-door car, this detail is relevant too, and goes into the cafe. I follow behind and introduce myself, and after a polite introduction, things begin to get, well, weird. You see, I order a Coke and he says, don't you want to drink? I was going to pop into the bar, which is connected to the cafe, and get one. I say no, I'm not drinking, and he looks at me with a sort of WTF look, as if I'm being unreasonable. I already explained in messages that I don't drink as I'm on medication, so having to re-explain it again got to me a bit. He seems disappointed and goes to order a cider from the bar while I get a table. Anyway, we sat down with our drinks, and my date immediately goes on about going back to his place again, even though the original plan was to stay here and order food, and I already stated that that wasn't happening. He says something along the lines of having a few drinks and eating at his place, and I said that we don't have to eat, we can just have our drinks and leave. He gets defensive and says that he has money, but prefers it if we go back to his. I make a joke and say, you're not a killer, are you? And instead of laughing it off, he stares at me sort of uncannily and says, You don't think that I would hurt you, do you? I laugh uncomfortably and say, Of course not, but really I'm relieved that this date won't be going any further. The date suddenly says, Are you going to follow me in your car? Because that wouldn't make sense. How about we go in my car, but I've got packages in the front, so you'll have to squeeze in the back and I'll drop you back off at your car after. In reality, that made less sense. The fact that it was completely illogical too made it even more creepy in my mind. Every alarm bell was going off at this point, and I said, Look, I don't want to go to yours, and your insistence is giving me the creeps. The date looked shocked, 
mumbles something about needing the toilet and excuses himself from the table. A few moments later, I see him through the cafe window getting into his car and driving off. Obviously, it was a massive bullet dodge in my opinion. But as I was watching him leave, also the fact that his car didn't actually have back doors made it seem even more sinister because imagine if something did happen in the car and then you just couldn't get out. I mean, being in those back seats, there was no way out but past him. So before I begin this, I just want to say that I'm looking for some answers to what happened to me when I was around 12 to 13 years old. I'm 23 now, but these events, they still loom over me. So at the time, I was living in Virginia with my parents and two step-siblings. We had recently moved into a newly built townhouse development. Our townhouse had three floors in total. The upstairs area is where the bedrooms were located. The living room and the kitchen were on the main floor, and the basement was my sister's bedroom. At the time, I was becoming increasingly interested in the paranormal too. I would watch all sorts of ghost shows on television, and eventually I learned what a Ouija board was. I wanted one too, but I knew that I wouldn't have the means to buy a real one myself, and I knew my parents would not approve too, so I opted to make my own. I created a template on a piece of cardboard, carefully replicating what a real one would look like. For the planchette, I used a plastic square-shaped lid that was the perfect size. I heard that it wasn't safe to use it by myself, and I didn't have any friends in the area at the time, so I asked my sister if she would try it with me. She was reluctant at first, but after some convincing, she was game. Her uncle had recently passed a few months prior, so we decided to try and contact him. We set the board up in the basement, her bedroom, with a picture of her uncle next to us. We both lightly put our fingers on the makeshift planchette, and I began to ask questions like, Uncle so-and-so, are you here with us tonight? To both of our surprise, too, it didn't take long to get a response. The planchette moved to yes with force. At first, I assumed that my sister was messing with me, but soon I would be proved wrong because she started crying very hard. After a few more questions with responses, my sister informed me that she wanted to stop. I don't really remember what else we asked because it was so long ago, but I do remember that the planchette would move with haste after every question that we asked, and we ended up informing her uncle that we were leaving and moving the piece to goodbye. Afterwards, it took some time for my sister to calm down, and I was pretty blown away myself, I'll admit. But then, strange things started happening to me almost immediately after. After we had finished using the board, we both went upstairs to calm down and watch some TV. And 30 minutes later, I heard a bang come from the basement. I went downstairs to investigate and found that the planchette had moved from goodbye to no, and a picture on the wall had fallen down. This disturbed me a bit, so afterwards I opted to tear up the board and throw it away. After I did this, I assumed that that was the end of it, and for my sister it was. I didn't know that this was the beginning of months of pure terror for me. I don't know why, but whatever this thing was attached to me. My sister didn't have any odd occurrences afterwards, but meanwhile, I started noticing strange things happening. It started sort of small at first. I noticed our family dog would all of a sudden refuse to come into my bedroom. I would pick him up and take him into my room anyways, and when he was in there, he would act really strange. His ears would stick straight up, and his eyes would fixate on a certain corner in the room. He would whine and bark, and occasionally his head would dart around like he was watching something move around. Then, I was sitting in my room another day on my own. I was watching TV and laughing at the show that I was watching. My school blinders were sort of sitting all the way at the foot of my bed, and I was sitting at the head of the bed a good distance away, when one of the blinders slid all the way across my bed, hitting me in the arm. This freaked me out, and I informed my parents, but they told me that I was just imagining things. And weird things like this kept happening to me. But one time I walked into the kitchen during the day by myself, and a sponge that was sitting on the dining room table suddenly flew across a room with force. I continued to experience things like this and 
they started becoming uh, more frequent, I guess you could say. I talked to my sister about it, and she told me that nothing odd was happening for her. I was just a complete mess at the time, though. I did not want to go home and would often try and go to a friend's house after school instead, which most of the time didn't work out. I talked to my parents again, and go figure, they thought that I was making it up for attention again. After a little bit of going through it, though, I had the most terrifying night of my life, and this event still sends shivers down my spine when I think about it. It traumatized me, and although I've worked past it for the most part, I still try not to think about it. I've only told a few people in my life about this, too, because it sounds like a straight-up lie, and I know it. But this... This night was the climax of my experiences, and after this happened, the activity just completely stopped. So one night, I was lying in my bed, it was 2 or 3 in the morning and I couldn't sleep, so I was just sort of laying there. My whole family was asleep and the house was completely dark. I slept with my door open at the time and the only light source was a blue light emanating from my radio in my room. It was just bright enough to illuminate my room, and I had my blanket over my head, covering half my face, but I could still see my room from waist height down to the floor. And to my horror, as I laid there with my eyes open, a black figure entered my field of vision near the foot of my bed. It was right next to my bed too, and there was no color on whatever this was. It was a pure pitch black, with no obvious features. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't scream, I couldn't move, I just laid there as I watched this thing slowly move down my bed until it stopped right in front of my face. I then felt a hand placed on my head through the blanket that was over me. The hand rested there for a second and then began moving in a circular motion for a few seconds. Eventually the hand lifted and I watched the dark figure slowly move away and then out of the room. This was the last thing that ever happened to me. After that, like I said, it just completely stopped as fast as it started. This whole ordeal has had a huge impact on my life. This is the first time that I'm sharing this story like this with a lot of people. I haven't tried until now because I didn't want to type it out and relive it, I guess. And now I'm more curious as to what the heck happened to me and what that thing was. I think I should probably also add that, aside from anxiety and depression issues, I am mentally sound. I've never experienced hallucinations or delusions, not that I know of anyway, and I know that what happened to me was real. I'm sharing this not only to share my story, but to also gain insight from others. So, what do you think this could have been? Was it a demon as I've heard? Has anyone hearing this had any similar experiences? I wish that I could be more detailed, but it's been so long and I've largely tried to forget about this time of my life that it's really hard to remember everything. But if you can help me out, then thanks in advance. Four years ago, I was a sophomore in high school. I hadn't yet got my license and this is right around the time that I started to partake. Me and one of my friends in the neighborhood, Kurt, knew of a creek about a mile and a half from my house, which would be a nice place to smoke, but it was a bit of a hike to get there. It was well known that there was a few scattered structures in the woods there too, such as a concrete hut, an old barrel fire pit, and a platform built into the trees, all within a few dozen feet of each other. This is all about a quarter mile into the woods and about a half a mile from any roads. We had been there during the daytime dozens of times before, usually with more friends. But we lived in a nice suburban neighborhood, so it didn't seem dangerous to us. Not to mention, nobody else had ever been spotted there before. In fact, it had become a pretty common smoking spot for kids our age. We all just assumed that it was an old abandoned homeless structure, but there were still legends passed around by other high schoolers making claims of something sinister there. Hooks for hands, serial murders, inbred cannibals, typical campfire stories, I guess you could say, that type of thing. Anyway, the concrete hut itself was about 7 by 7 by 5 foot, and the ground had been dug out on the inside, making the roof even taller. We had found improvised weapons, food, cans, trash there, 
This was all when we first discovered it two years earlier, but nothing of that nature since then. Just beer cans, roaches, and cigarette butts scattered around the fire pit from neighborhood kids. The inside was scribbled with Sharpie, the top was covered with a tarp, and the whole thing smelled terrible, so none of us dared to enter it. Like I mentioned before, there was also a lookout platform built into a tree about 50 feet away. An improvised ladder made of branches led to the 5x5 platform about 20 feet off the ground. The wood was clearly water damaged, so I had never wanted to actually go up there. Back on track though, this particular October evening, Kurt and I left at about 6pm, hoping to get there before dark. We had several other smoke spots that were closer to my house, but nothing quite matched the excitement and mystique of the hut. So we make our way through the neighborhood, through some backyards, into a field, and we finally pass through the tree line. Stones laid out across the creek allowed us to cross without getting wet. But right around the time we got there too, the sun was almost fully set, and no light was coming through the trees. This was the first time either of us had been there at night. We hiked the last 500 feet uphill, and we could just barely see the hut through the darkness. The atmosphere, though, had us both uneasy that day, and... We talked with the quietest whisper possible, but we didn't want to approach the structure, so we decided to smoke about 50 feet from the hut, right on the edge of the bluff that we just climbed. I decided to shift a few feet over to more even footing before we started, and I felt my foot snag on a fishing line running about a foot off the ground, tied to the tree next to me. A loud clang was made as the line yanked an empty metal bucket into a metal scrap planted on the ground, almost like a makeshift alarm. We hear someone moving down from the platform in the tree about 20 feet away from us and drop into the leaves below. We take off down the bluff, sliding on our butts and hitting trees and we still hear scurrying and grunting behind us. We get to the bottom and sprint through the creek. I trip on a loose rock below me and fall into the freezing cold water before bolting up and continuing to run. About a second later, we hear splashes behind us. At this point, we clear the tree line and are in a quarter mile of open field. We sprint as fast as we can away. Kurt and I are hurt, out of breath, and the person is clearly catching up. We can hear them right behind us breathing heavily and their loud footsteps growing closer and closer. We sprint through someone's backyard and we hear their dog start barking. We finally run into the middle of the street and a car slams on their brakes. Kurt and I screech to a halt to avoid this car. We turn around to see somebody standing just outside of the floodlights of a nearby house. Before they turn around and run away back towards the forest. We apologize to the driver, ditch the weed and... I called my sister to come and pick us up. We explained to her what happened, begged her not to tell my parents, and after that, we never returned to that creek ever again. This story occurred a few years back now, while I was staying at my grandparents' house during vacation. They lived near the Atlantic Wall, the system of concrete blockhouses built by Nazi Germany during World War II. At the time, I was 16 and fascinated with urbex, so I thought that it would be a great idea to go and explore those. But when I arrived on the beach, I started exploring and everything went well, since this place is actually public and a lot of people come here like you would do any normal beach, I guess. Time passed by and there was nothing really interesting to see, so I made the decision to go deep into the dunes to find other structures. I found some, but they were all sort of buried in the sand or covered with vegetation, until I found this one. I was super excited, and when I arrived, I started to barge in just like I did before. But suddenly, a gut feeling stopped me at one of the entrances. I kept quiet and listened. There was this sort of... I don't know, like indistinct chatter or moaning. Honestly, I don't know what kept me around after that, but for some stupid reason, I chose the option of yelling, hello, is anyone there, multiple times. The sounds coming from inside stopped, and the atmosphere was getting quite tense, so I made my way to the roof. It was a single ramp, no exit, stupid decision again, but curiosity was too strong. A few minutes later... A middle-aged man comes out and started the weirdest discussion with me. He asked me if I was alone and what my age was. 
I was obviously a minor, then proceeded to tell me that what they were doing inside was perfectly right and I shouldn't call the police without waiting for my answers. At the end of his little speech, he asked me if I wanted to go inside. Obviously, I refused. Thank God he didn't insist and went back in. As I went away, I passed by one of the other entrances that happened to provide a direct view of the inside. I took a peek and instantly ran the heck out of there. What I briefly saw was another old man, naked, playing with himself, looking at me. In the background, I saw many other figures and candles on the ground. I heard some sort of chanting too. After I put enough distance, I took my phone out and called the police. What I told them was just too surreal for them to believe me and I was basically laughed at and given a lecture about prank calls. And no one believes me other than my dad. He had weird encounters in those dunes as well. I don't know what kind of stuff in a bunker trying to lure miners in that was, but after that... I quit Urbex. Also, I never thought of it, but I actually just found an article online related to this. Basically, the beach that I went to is right next to a nudist beach. I must have crossed the border by going into the dunes without realizing it, but over the past 40 years, the beach was about to be closed multiple times since libertines see an opportunity to go there and have sex. Many of them cause disruption since it's completely illegal to do that. Plus, the dunes are a protected environment, so it's actually forbidden to go there. And after I just had a chat with my grandma, she says that police went there many times already to make them leave, but it doesn't stop them from going back. Ironically, too, the article mentioned the raising concerns about the situation lasting exactly from the same period this happened to me. And well, those guys that I met are very extreme libertines, apparently, and... Some suggested that I go back there with friends to collect evidence, but I have to wait till next summer. Plus, confronting these people really doesn't seem like a good idea to me. Also, just to be clear, the article is not about a, a sex cult or anything wicked like that. It simply mentions the conflict between naturists and libertines who come on this beach to get it on and whatnot, and how the authorities want to close the beach regarding that, and that was pretty much it. It was a coincidence supporting my story, but not about my story, if you get my drift. Anyway, like I said, after this, I quit Urbex, and maybe I'll go back at some point and have a look around, but I won't be doing it alone this time, that's for sure. A few years back, I was living with my aunt and uncle after moving to a new state. They had just moved into a new home and a new subdevelopment. In this area, door-to-door -door salesmen swarm new developments and new buildings for water softeners, cleaning supplies, solar panels, generators, and the Kirby vacuum people. They wandered the neighborhood all day knocking on doors, but were usually gone by around 5 p.m. This particular evening, I was home alone with my dog, a mutt who was mostly black lab and an unknown mixture. He was roughly the size and weight of a full-breed Labrador, but he had a sort of stockier build and long, wiry hair. He was a gentle, sweet baby who was upset if someone spoke harshly to him. I'd never known him to be threatening to anyone. My aunt and uncle were out celebrating their anniversary. This time of year, the days were getting longer, and we would have full dark by around 8pm. It was around 7pm and starting to get dusky when someone rang the doorbell and knocked on the door. The door was one with those sort of thick glass over windows and I could see the door and who was there from the kitchen. I was going to ignore them but unfortunately they could see me and continued to knock so I went to answer the door. The dog followed me but stood off to the side in the shadows of the dining room. The person at the door was a young man, about college age, dressed in a college shirt and tie and khakis. It looked a bit like a Mormon missionary with style I guess you could say. He was thin and about my height, 5'8", 5'9". I figured he was a salesman of some sort, but thought that it was a bit odd that he was out this late in the day. I thought that I'd open the door a crack, tell him that I'm not interested, and then just lock the door. So I open the door a few inches to speak through it, and he starts his spiel about Kirby vacuum cleaners, and he wants to come in and give a demo and all that. But one, 
It's not my house, and two, I know once they get in that they aren't leaving without selling something, and I have no need for an overpriced vacuum, and I don't have a thousand plus dollars to spend anyway. So I tell him no thank you, I'm not interested, and begin to close the door when he puts his foot between the door and the door jam, and throws his hands up to stop the door from closing. This is when I think, what the heck? And I hear a vicious growling behind me to my right, and then a loud deep barking as my dog lunges for the door. I grab his collar to keep him from going out the door, and the guy's mouth drops open. His eyes get really wide, and he looks like he's ready to pass out or pee himself as he jumps back from the door and backs away saying, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, wrong house, wrong house, and then turns and runs to the end of the driveway where a car with three men in it pulls up to get him, allegedly, and they speed off, tires squealing. I told my aunt and uncle about it when they got home and we told a few neighbours so that they could keep an eye out for unusual behaviour. It's possible that they were a team of Kirby salesmen, I suppose. They do travel in teams of four sometimes and follow the door knockers in the car with the vacuum, but I was suspicious because it was late in the day for them to be knocking on doors and it was a team of four men. Usually they have a team with two or more women in the group because they're knocking on doors at a time of day when women are going to be home alone and unlikely to let strange men in. So, I still don't know if it was a team of Kirby salesmen or not, but something tells me that it wasn't. And I'm sure glad that my dog was there with me that day to save my butt. So one summer, I was traveling in East Africa. I was fairly young and hadn't even finished high school, but I was with a small group of people who were about my age. Our group had two trip leaders who stayed with us the whole time, in addition to local guides who accompanied us for different legs of the trip. During the trip, we went to Serengeti National Park to spend a few days going on safaris. Following our first day of safaris, it was time to go to site where we would be sleeping. When we arrived at the site, which was in the middle of the national park in the evening, and I was quite surprised to see that the only things there were basic camping tents and an outhouse. I'd been on safaris before, but we stayed in actual buildings, so this was a bit unexpected. Anyway, the night finally comes and it's time for everyone to go to bed. Our group was split up by gender. The girls were in one tent and guys in another, with trip leaders and local guides in their own, there was only one other guy my age on the trip, so it was just me and him sharing a tent to ourselves. The outhouse was away from the tents, about 50 meters or so. It smelled horrible, so nobody wanted to sleep next to it. Our local guides instructed us to always go to the outhouse in pairs because of the dangerous wildlife in the park, which we were camping right in the middle of. I assumed that this was a standard precautionary warning that they'd issued as a just-in-case... But about halfway through the night, I suddenly was desperate to take a pee. I didn't want to wake up the other guy in my tent to go to the outhouse, so I decided to just pee right behind our tent by myself. So I grabbed my headlamp, put on my shoes, and I head outside. As I'm peeing, I hear something on the ground nearby crack, though. It couldn't have been more than 10 meters away, and I instantly turned my head to shine my dull headlamp in that direction, which illuminates two pairs of eyes that are intensely staring right back at me. If you don't know, animal eyes have a reflection when you shine a light on them at night. And I was completely paralyzed by how close these creatures were to me, how still they were being. We stared at each other for 10 to 15 seconds before I decided to hurry back into the tent and tried to fall back to sleep. The next morning, as our whole group is eating breakfast... The girls start talking about how something brushed up against their tent in the night and scared them half to death. I tell them about the two pairs of eyes that were staring at me and how it scared me too, when one of our local guides chimes in to say that it was just hyenas and that there's nothing to be afraid of since they're scared of humans. This calms the group down a bit. I deer hunt a bit though, so I knew that different animals reflect different colors when you shine a light at their eyes. So I asked the guide what color hyena eyes reflect and he said blue. I told him that the eyes that I saw were gold and asked what animal reflects that color. 
He seems a bit shocked by that, but replies that the only animal that that could have been was apparently lions. When my daughter was two, I was having a really tough time as a single mother, and so I decided to take a road trip up Highway 1. I made reservations in Trinidad at a cool cabin in the woods, within walking distance of the beach. Before I left, my stepfather gave me a loaded 38 revolver, which I stored under the driver's seat. Sometime after driving through San Francisco, it was very late and dark and nobody was on the highway. My daughter was sleeping peacefully in her car seat next to me. Back then, we could legally have car seats in the front. I noticed a car, though, coming up behind me and passed, but then sort of slowed down, driving alongside of me. I sped up and slowed down, but I just couldn't shake him. I looked over, and this guy had his interior light on and was furiously gesturing for me to pull over. I knew that I had to find a safe place. There was nobody else on the road, and I was running low on gas. There was just nothing on the highway for miles, but... I kept driving, and this guy just wouldn't leave me alone. I was getting pretty frightened, but the mama bear was coming out, and I was getting very angry as well. I knew that he could see my kid, who was still sleeping. Finally, there was an exit up ahead and a gas station in the middle of nowhere, so I took the exit with the guy closely following me. I really wasn't sure what to do. I mean, the gas station was brightly lit, but it had no customers. I didn't feel that it was safe to pull in, so... I slowly passed it, drove further into the dark, deserted landscape, and pulled into a large dirt area and drove quite a ways off the highway with him following. There was absolutely nothing around, and I knew that I was in big trouble, and I needed to take control and wanted to put him in a vulnerable situation. Mama Bear was in full protective mode now. So I stopped the car, I grabbed the gun, and I jumped out, locking the car behind me. As he pulled up, I ran around to the passenger side and waited. He then got out of his car and quickly moved towards me, and I suddenly held the gun up, visible in the moonlight. He came to a halt, surprised, and then I leveled the gun across the car, taking aim, and waited. He stood there, seemingly weighing his options, and then just turned around, got back in his car, and he left. I think the eeriest thing about this whole thing, though, is that not a single word was spoken the whole time. The whole thing... It totally freaked me out. This occurred around 1999 and 2000. So my best friend and I were avid outdoor adventurers and also amateur pot growers. But we would frequently find secluded places in the woods that allowed for ample light and shade for plants to grow and that would not allow them to be easily found. One particular day, we went to an annex of trails located near a New Jersey State Park trail system. The trails weren't actually in the park, but I had hiked them before and knew that they weren't, well, frequented that much. We had gone out that day with our seeds, partially sprouted in moist paper towels. We parked the car at the trailhead and we started hiking in. We covered a mile or so and then ventured off the trail and into the woods. We found a clearing... We found a clearing, planted the seeds, and tied a few barely visible ribbons off to mark the way to the plant spot to check them in the future. My friend and I got back on the trail and we started walking back to the car, when my friend noticed a, a man in the other direction just sort of staring at us. He was probably in his 30s or 40s, bald head, normal clothes. We didn't think anything of it for the most part, but we definitely kept looking back as anyone would when someone is behind them in the woods, right? We saw that he was walking 60 plus or so feet behind us. It seemed weird, but it was probably more so due to us having anxiety that we just planted seeds. We picked up the pace, but the men also seemed to pick up the pace as we weren't gaining any distance. At one point, we decided to just get off the trail and let him pass. We turned off the trail and walked into a thicket of sticks and bushes, which I remember vividly getting shredded on. We got deeper into the woods and then we heard cursing. When we turned around, the man was coming through where we entered. It was at that moment that we actually became scared. 
Mind you, we were two strong 19-year-olds, but a man following you in the woods is pretty darn creepy. We made a kind of U maneuver to sort of outflank him and came out of the woods a bit further down the trail. And once on the trail, well, we ran. As we were running, there was a fork in the trail and my friend went right and I went left. I realized my mistake as my buddy was going down the correct path and I wasn't. So I turned around and started running back towards the fork to follow my friend. As I was running towards the direction that we came from to get to the fork... I could see the man running towards me down the trail. He was a distance away, but not far enough in my eyes. Survival mode kicked in and I ran as hard as I could. I caught up to my friend who was sort of walking at that point. I screamed, he's after us, and we both booked it all the way to the car. We got in the car, shaking and out of breath. We backed up and started to get out of the parking lot when the man appeared at the trailhead. He stopped there and just sort of stared at us as we finally drove away. Now, I always wonder what all of that was about. Did he want to kill a couple of 19-year-olds there and then? Was he also doing something illegal in those woods and wanted us gone? My buddy and I still laugh and talk about that day 22 years ago, and we also wonder if those seeds ever took root. This one time when I was like 15, I was staying the night at a friend's house and I had this really weird experience. The area is very wooded around the house and there's a good distance between each neighboring house. Well, we were all in the basement, I was laying on a futon watching my friends play a game and at some point I wound up falling asleep at around 10pm I believe. But I woke up not even an hour after that to... One of my friends frantically trying to wake me up to go upstairs. I asked why and he told me that someone was outside the house. I rush upstairs to see the friend that lived there with a pistol pointed at the front door. He told me that he was sitting at the dining table when he saw someone peer into the glass part of his front door. He had me stay with his niece on the other side of the house while we waited for his older brother to get home. I was really freaked out but... After his brother had gotten home, it turns out that he had all the security cameras all around the house and when they checked it, they watched the footage when there was nothing there. Not a single sign of someone approaching the home at all. To this day, I still wonder if he was just seeing something or if it was something else entirely that he had actually seen. Weirdly, I've had a lot of situations like this happen with this particular friend and it always happened when I was asleep, which obviously is very strange. I'll begin this story with a quick note about the home that I grew up in. The home was an old mill home that was moved from one location to where it stands now and a basement was dug during the construction by my family. The home looks like your normal home, I guess, unless you really look at it, because there's a window above the garage that always seems to give a sort of eerie feeling, like someone was watching me through there. Now, I've never seen anyone standing there, obviously, but for some reason you just cannot rid yourself of that uneasy feeling. Growing up, I had multiple paranormal occurrences. My father raised me and my sister in that home, so she and I had spent plenty of time alone. When I was a younger child, I never slept without a light, TV, or radio on. I needed noises, light, or something to distract me from feeling uneasy and watched. I don't know any other history of my home except that it was moved. I feel like whatever is in that house is unhappy about that fact too. The house almost feels, uh, I don't know, like cursed in a way. I don't have the same nostalgic sense that people get from seeing or visiting their childhood home. Even today when I visit, I feel uncomfortable still. Anyway, one day I was left alone in my preteen years. I was a fairly responsible kid and I was just playing on the computer while my father was out running some errands. I heard a voice coming through the speakers, which was impossible as the computer was not hooked to the internet, nor was I playing a game that had voices as... I was playing solitaire on windows. Next, I heard heavy, loud footsteps coming from the hallway towards the room that I was in. 
They sounded a lot like the cowboy boots that my dad always wore. So I said, hello, dad, but there was no answer. I wasn't freaked out until I peeked out of the room and I didn't see anyone. At that, I ran outside and the truck wasn't there either. I instantly picked up the house phone to call my dad and went hitting the green call button. The phone made a sort of loud screeching sound. I dropped the phone where I stood without hanging up and I ran outside until my dad showed up about 30 minutes later. Of course, I tried to tell him what happened and he replied, Well, you probably just picked up a semi-driver's radio on the computer and you're just hearing things. I couldn't believe that he thought that I was making it up, to be honest. So, over the years, I didn't have many problems with the home until I was alone again in my bedroom, studying on my bed, my cat Spock sitting with me on my book. After an hour or so, he suddenly just got up and fluffed up fur standing on edge, staring towards my open closet. He hissed and spat at what seemed like nothing, but then the room got really cold, and I of course got up to see what he could have been so frightened of. But nothing was there, nor did I hear anything. Now, that was until I heard whispering outside of my bedroom door. I quickly swung it open, but again, there was nothing. In the end, I wrote it off as the heater making noise and I went to bed, or tried to at least. I laid down, lamp still on, when all of a sudden my radio turned itself on. This was an old radio without a remote, so there was no way that it could just turn on without hitting the button. And because of that, I didn't sleep that night. My story picks back up again when I was 18. I lived alone in the house as my father had picked up a job in another state I had a friend over for the night, and after our movie marathon, we tried to go to bed. As we sat there in the quiet dark, he said, Do you hear that? He what, I asked. Those voices. There are people talking. What? He shushed me, and as we sat there in the darkness, you could hear two people whispering to each other outside of my bedroom. I got up to investigate, and there was nobody there. Screw this, he said. I picked up my cell phone to call my dad and instead of the phone ringing I got a sort of message saying that the number wasn't in service. That was impossible I said. So we ran outside and I drove to a church parking lot. I dialed my dad again and it went through but he didn't answer. I called my best friend to ask if we could sleep at her house for the night and she agreed. That friend spent many nights at my house as a child and she also felt the unease in my home and she understood. My last paranormal experience though, that happened when I moved back into my parents' home after a failed relationship many years later in 2017. I was taking a nap on the couch while my dad was out and I was woken up by someone whispering in my ear, hey. I swung up off the couch, looked around confused and I grabbed my cell phone. When I tried to call my dad, it did the exact same screeching sound that the home phone did all those years ago. Again, I just sat outside crying, waiting on him to get home. He still didn't believe what I had experienced, and to this day, he still writes it all off. So I just got back from a family vacation in Mexico. We stayed at a nice western resort, and usually around 9.30pm, my family would head back to their rooms to go to sleep. Naturally, as a 25-year-old, I wanted to stay up and party or go drinking at bars, but my older brother was working remotely and wouldn't go out with me. After the family went to bed, I went out to a bar around the corner from my hotel and ended up befriending the locals there and a 29-year-old guy from San Diego named Luke, who was there for a wedding. We got together and we sort of had a bit of fun. We started hanging out every night, in fact, after my family went to sleep and on the third night of the trip, Luke asked if I wanted to meet him downtown with his friends. I really wanted to, but I was at an important dinner with the family that went on later than usual. I ended up staying home that night, but the next night I met him at this huge Pablo Escobar-esque mansion they rented on Airbnb, and he told me that it was good that I couldn't make it out the night before because of how scary of an experience it was. 
He went on to explain to me that the night before, his buddy was taking a, a pee outside and someone approached him and held out a key with a bump of coke on it. Without thinking, he snorted the bump and the person who offered it was now demanding that he buy an $80 bag from them. He was drunk and refused while getting pretty aggressive towards them. Things went from bad to worse as the Mexican who offered the bump started following their group from bar to bar for the next three hours, taking pictures of them. He called his friends and there were now a group of them following behind, claiming to be affiliated with the cartel. They warned that if Luke's buddy didn't pay them, they were going to call their boss. Luke eventually went over and tried to smooth things over. They told him that his friends had stolen from them and that it was going to cost him his life if someone didn't pay up. The cartel member also pulled his shirt up, revealing a 9mm pistol at his waistband. Luke did the right thing and remained calm while offering to take them to an ATM and pay out the pocket, 160 US, so they could be left alone. The cartel members gave him an empty coke bag and abruptly left. Even after him doing all this for his friend's safety, his friend denied any responsibility or wrongdoing, and even had the audacity to blame Luke for trying to help by getting involved. He also didn't offer Luke a single dollar. After this event happened, Luke got robbed again too in the same night with a girl who ripped his $200 gold necklace right off of his neck, and his friend was cool to me but sounded like a real jerk I guess after Luke explained this to me. The poor dude was just trying to be a good friend and was met with no gratitude, only to be robbed again that night. Needless to say, I'm pretty happy that I didn't make it out to meet them that night. I also think things could have gotten a lot worse for them had he not offered the cartel members money. Be careful out there guys, and obviously, never accept free drugs from a stranger on the street in Mexico, or really anywhere, because it always comes with a price. For 12 years, I've worked as an actor for a local haunted house attraction. It's a lot of fun as I get to play a variety of horror characters and act out different scenes. And while the tours that we put on are clearly fake, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that, well, just isn't. I should start off by explaining that the building that we do this out of is extremely old and was once an elementary school. We gutted the section of the building that was classrooms and we constructed it to what we needed. And this is when we actually started having weird experiences. Now, there's plenty of activity that can be just shrugged off, such as feeling watched and hearing footsteps running in areas where no one is. But then there are things that are just not so easy to disregard. Such as one evening, a member was working on hooking up our sound system by himself. He had not even hooked up the large speakers yet when he stated that a large deep growl came booming through them. This terrified him so much that he ran out of the building and just wouldn't go back in, even to lock up until another member came down to go in with him. He never worked alone in the building again after that too. It just really shook him to the core. Other activity seems playful and childlike, I guess, such as hearing small giggles and whispering in the halls and in the rooms that are empty, things being moved from where we last placed them, but one year, I was in a rocking chair that I would jump out of as a group came through. The thing about the rocking chair is it was more like a glider and it was sort of broken and I would have to use a lot of force to get the chair to rock backwards at all. It was right before showtime. I was sitting in this broken chair getting mentally pumped up for the night ahead. I was completely alone when I swear that I felt someone grab onto the back of the chair and harshly pull it backwards. I felt myself flying backwards with the chair and I honestly thought that I would flip out of it. Thankfully, that didn't happen and as soon as I stabled myself, I jerked to see who had done this. But the room that I was in was large and no one could get out of this room without me seeing them running away in the split second that it took me to look behind me and there was absolutely no one there and I was suddenly covered in goosebumps. No one was even in the area around my room at the time. Later that same night too, the lights were off, my stove was on and a group had just left my room when I noticed a, a small figure in the far right corner of the room. 
It looked like a small child crouching down looking my way and I was immediately worried that a child had been left behind from the previous group. As I headed towards the figure to ask if they were okay, the strobe flashed and the figure that I saw was just gone. This same year but different night, I was again sitting in my chair waiting for the next group when someone or something growled right into my ear. It was so loud that it caused my ear to ring and when I turned to see who was there that could have done this, again, there was nothing but an empty room. I changed rooms the next year and did not experience as much creepy stuff, that's for sure. But there's not much history that I've been able to find out about the building too, but I'm really curious as to what could be causing all this weirdness. This is only a tiny bit of what has been experienced over the years too working there, and I don't feel that it'll be stopping anytime soon, so who knows, maybe I'll be back at some stage to tell you guys more. So every morning I wake up at 2am to let my dog out and then we get back to sleep together on the recliner. I have neighbours but they aren't squished to right up against my house or anything. There's a sort of field behind my house too and behind that field there's a few miles of dense woods. So I take my dog out towards the field because he doesn't like doing his business right up against the house. This morning I hop up and take him out like normal leash goes on and I grab my jacket. We walk out towards the field and he starts sniffing around and doing his thing. When out of nowhere I hear a clear male voice say hi there. I played it off as 2am groggy brain but my dog heard it too. His hair shot up all down his back and his tail was tucked. He started looking around and growling. I was instantly freaked out and we hurried back inside. Mind you, I had a flashlight and I saw no one there. There couldn't have been really anyone near me too. It's 2am and my backyard is fairly large, but there's really nowhere else to go. The field is large too and the grass is about a foot tall, I guess, but the voice sounded like it came from only a few feet away. I still can't wrap my head around it, but I went out at 2 again and didn't hear anything this time. I was on edge the entire time and my poor dog was too. The spot where I take him is right at the edge of my property and the large field, so there's no way anyone was hiding near me or anything. The woods start about 40 yards away from the edge of the field. The only thing near me during this experience was a single tree on my property and the field with one foot tall grass. My tree is about maybe 18 foot tall and too skinny for a human to climb up. But I even flashed my light on it after my dog started growling because possums like to sit in it. I have another dog who doesn't like getting up at 2am so her fat tail will just wait until 6 to go out. Strangely enough she won't go near the edge of the field anymore too. That's where she did her business and even in broad daylight she won't go there anymore. Also I'm going to start recording my dog's nightly bathroom trips because I'd honestly prefer this to never happen again but if it does then I want to catch something. And it would put me at ease knowing that I have proof of the event, I guess. I still don't know how to feel about it. I've never really paid attention to anything paranormal. I've only ever had another experience, but it's pretty mundane to be honest. To me, the smaller and rarer the event, I guess the more terrifying it feels, though, when the realization sets in that something actually did happen. And that night, I can say for sure that... Something weird definitely took place.